Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Good morning and hello kids and welcome to season three and episode number 350 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryomedia Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Monday, April 1st, 2024, April Fool's Day. And it's no joke. We have a show for you today. Woohoo. <laughs> that was a dad joke. That was totally a dad joke. I know. I haven't planned anything specific to try and trick you for April Fool's Day, kids. Okay. So, just, just so you know. But I did do it with my theater company, though. Because <laughs> we're called Domino Theater. And the main sports venue in Kingston just got called the Slush Puppy Center. Just got renamed. We put out something with, we did it in conjunction with Theater Kingston, put out a press release today saying that Domino Theater is uh, officially changing its name to uh, Domino Pizza's Theater. Yeah. And uh, if the yeah. first act isn't done within 30 minutes or less, your ticket's free. <laughs> I'm sure there's people who fell for that. <laughs> we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Just it just went out, so we'll we'll see what how okay. <laughs> little impish, but nothing planned for the show. So everything you hear today is going to be all true. Or well, is it? Very much. I got, <laughs> I got something for you that you might think is a is an April Fool's Day, but it's not. This is not a joke. Check this out. This is from Stephen Gibo. Is it? Does he go by Gibo or Gibo? Gibo. Gibo, I thought so. This is from Stephen Gibo. It wasn't that long ago that good climate policy wasn't dominated by cynical partisan games and which team jersey you wore. Conservative leaders could once admit publicly that Canada carbon rebates made the carbon price a good deal for both their wallets and the environment. That's a pretty fair statement, right? Take a look at this. Not an April Fool's Day joke. Taxes, so I know we got eight hundred and eight dollars and fifty cents. We get an extra little bump uh, for me and my husband because we live in a rural environment. And when I go back and look at what I spent last year in carbon taxes, because I was working from home, I wasn't commuting. My gas bills were way down. My mm -hmm. and even the amount of uh, of tax that I paid on my home heating, because we're principally natural gas where where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that I probably ended up better off with that transfer and so i think a lot of people would be of the view that if you're going to implement some kind of carbon or revenue neutral carbon pricing that's probably not a bad way of doing it that just <laughs> is that the icing on the cake or what and again not an april fool's day joke that's a real legitimate thing and uh, he posted that 12 hours ago so it was prior to april fools right Here's the best part right. about it. You remember last week when she got called out for protesting the tax? And we the question, are you protesting the carbon tax or the four cent tax that you're applying to the gasoline come Monday? Yeah. <laughs> Duplicitous, lying. She just said it there. The internet's forever, remember? She said it. You benefit from a rebate. I got more money back. The premier who protested that same tax a week ago yeah this is gold <laughs> indeed this uh the source of this by the way for people who are not watching at home or just listening to the podcast it's from the fraser institute itself and she mm -hmm. said this on september 10th 2021 the fraser so not so that known liberal think tank <laughs> the fraser institute yes she said this on september 10th 2021 so not 15 years ago or no. Over 10 years ago, when she was a member of the Wild Rose, like who it was when she made her impassioned plea for gay straights alliances, even though now she's opposed to anything transgender all of a sudden, even though she has someone transgender in her family. Yes. Now, just three years ago, 
not even a full three years ago, she was singing its praises. She gets a little bump. You know how she even moved her head, like a little bump, like she was like, got a little thrill out of that, get a little bump and saying it's not so bad, but now it'll curve your spine. Maybe she now, did a bump before that. I don't know. Uh, maybe. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but in terms of this type of thing, she was so enthusiastic about it then mm -hmm. and she's completely changed her mind. Now they'll turn around and say something like, oh, when this was first proposed, they said it would go to $50. Because now we're about to go to 80, right? We went to 65, and then now we're going to 80. He says, we went to $50. Well, I think I remember Stephen Carper saying it would go to 65. Yes, but he did. Ba basically, their thing is saying, but they're, they're turning around and saying, when this government introduced it back in 2019, they said it would only go to 50. They said it would go to 50 after the first five years. They never said it was going to go to 50 for the first five years, and we will never, ever raise it again after that. Yeah, because nothing ever goes up. Yes. So then they raised it again, and now they're at the same thing, right? We have our next set of price increases up to about $170 a ton. Now they're turning around going, will you keep on raising it again? The basic principle with that answer to that question is yes. That's the way carbon pricing works, is you gradually introduce it, and you gradually increase it, increase it, and increase it. Because, and yes, you keep on increasing it. You gradually, over time, try to make the price of things that are carbon intensive more expensive. So yes, that's the way carbon regulatory pricing works is that you keep raising the price while hopefully competition makes the price, the price of all your alternatives much less expensive. Isn't that what Scott Mo just said? <laughs> yes, that's what Scott Mo just said. He said, basically, we considered all these other things and none of them were cheaper. They all came with cost. Let's see, if you want a absolutely cost-free way of fighting carbon, that's not going to happen. Nothing is cost-free, my friend. Everything's going to have a cost. So you have the choice between what is considered the most effective and low-cost way to do it and everything else. And you're opting for everything else. What you're telling people is that you're opting for everything else, but what you're opting for really is nothing. Yes. Because you're asking people to rely on technology that doesn't yet exist. And that if it did exist, you, that you haven't actually singled that you're willing to spend the money to deploy. Yeah. Yeah. So Daniel Smith did say this, and this is coming around, and this is probably going to haunt her for the next while. And that will probably be their excuse to when they try to win the nanosecond to get out of it. Just, yes, but nobody told us it was ever going to go up to 80. This is like far beyond anything we've ever expected. That's why this is insane. Because that's about the only somewhat way out. But that's not true because in the last election we all knew that we were the party that we voted for was going to bring in more carbon tax more carbon pricing and they'll can then they'll say a whole bunch of people voted against it yes but if you count the votes for all the parties more canadians voted for parties that supported putting a price on carbon anyway so even that's not a, a valid argument it's exhausting with these people right they're never going to stop never we're going to stop. And concurrent with this, in March, on March 28th, in global, on global, sorry, global news, because it was Scott Moe had testified first. And I went to watch his testimony. I haven't watched a Daniel Smith and Blaine Higgs yet, but I watched Scott Moe's. Oh my God, he was a disaster. From beginning to end, mm -hmm. disaster. But he's sitting there and saying that it's breaking people, whatnot. And according to the Taxpayers Federation, Canadian Taxpayers Federation, they're calling to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to scrap the carbon price, which is set to increase on Monday, saying the average cost to Saskatchewan families is $525 this year. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation is saying that the average cost to the families is $525. Gee, wonder what Saskatchewan gets back. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Nothing. They used to, but then he decided he wasn't going to pay it, but then he actually has to pay it because he's taking it out of your... Oh, I'm not sure that nothing's correct there. Oh, they're getting money back? I thought they weren't getting the rebate because the province decided not to pay it, but they're actually, they actually are paying it. No, right now, they, they've gotten the rebate for last oh, year. Right, for, yes. They've Sorry. gotten the rebate. So, yeah, so a rebate for a family of four in Saskatchewan is $1,500, and for those in rural communities, it's 1800 but the carbon tax, according to Global, cost them 520 So they're netting money every single time. 
So if it costs a family an average of five hundred twenty-five, but they're getting eighteen hundred back if they live in a rural community and fifteen hundred dollar back, why is the Canadian Taxpayer Federation saying that calling to scrap the carbon price? If it actually does, even by their own accounting, leaves people over a thousand dollars per year better off. Taxpayers, I don't think the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is fighting for you. Seriously. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I've got this article right in front of me. The Canadian Taxpayer Prairie Director, Gage Hobrich. If Trudeau cares about making life more affordable, then at the very least, he wouldn't hike his carbon tax again. The parliamentary Budget Officer is clear. The carbon tax costs the average Saskatchewan families of $100 more every year than they get back in rebates. No, it doesn't, actually. And the Parliamentary Budget Officer did not say that. Parliamentary Budget Officer is very clear that if we're talking about the price paid directly, that 80% of households are better off. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something with about income growth over time. Income growth gets slightly affected over time. And if you count a whole bunch of other factors, people are slightly less better off. But if we're talking about income growth over time, we're not talking about the amount of money that you actually have in your pockets versus how much is going out. Income growth is a wholly different metric. And that can be affected by other things positively to compensate for that over time as well. But on your direct costs, money coming in, money going out, yeah, 80% more, of families yeah. are better off. So they're taking one tiny little statistic somewhere that includes a factor, an income growth factor, that none of these conservatives can explain. And oddly enough, in committee, when Yves Giroux was testifying, because he testified after Premier Scott Moe, nobody seemed to ask him to explain more what the income growth thing is. Because I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, like, oh, so there's two ways to see it. If you look at it this way and if you look at it the other way, and nobody turned around and says, could you please explain this the other way? Mm -hmm. So that people can understand how far they're through, how far conservatives are, how far they're reaching and stretching to try and be able to claim that it's making people worse off. Stretch like, Armstrong couldn't stretch that far. Exactly. So, according to this article, said the guy from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation said Saskatchewan people won't be able to afford this next tax hike, and they couldn't afford what was already in place. Uh, this is at the same time while Scott Moe is uh, in committee bragging about how Saskatchewan uh, is doing so well financially. Mm -hmm. I guess it is attracting all this investment. I guess, but then it has to turn around and say, yeah, but we're doing this despite the carbon price. Saskatchewan is doing so well. We've never been better. We're, nah, nah, nah. we're doing this, we're doing that. But oh my God, all our people are starving. Which one is it? Are you doing well or are your people starving? Which one is it? Yeah. Because both can't be true at the same time. Many Saskatchewan residents polled on the carbon price believes it should be abolished amid uncertainty around it and the increasing cost of living, of course, because nobody likes to pay a tax. And if you ask someone in a poll, would you rather pay a tax or not pay a tax? Um, most people will say, I'd rather not pay a tax. It's so, pretty simple, right? Yeah, that, this doesn't really mean much. Federal Natural Resources Minister Jonathan Wilkinson said roughly a month ago that Ottawa will no longer be giving the rebate to Saskatchewan residents because Premier Scott Moe's government is refusing to remit the federal levy on natural gas. Moe, in response, threatens that province that the province won't pay the levy on everything else affected by the carbon tax if residents don't see rebates. Quote, Canadians rightfully expect that everyone, including the provincial government, follows the law. And the price on pollution framework has been upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada, said Catherine Kuplinskas, press secretary for the Office of the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. The minister in charge of Sask Energy, Dustin Duncan, said he would be the one bearing the consequences of the provincial province's decision, which could include jail time. I'm guessing it could. I don't think it will in this doubtful. case. They're doubtful. But I guess, in theory, it could. But he is literally counseling people to break the law, which is a crime. Yes. This There's no true. two ways about it. That is literally a crime. Counseling people to break the law is a crime. And if the residents of Saskatchewan do get their rebate this time around, uh, it's going to be, despite what the government of Saskatchewan says, because they remitted that money to the federal government. They mm -hmm. may not have made the residents of Saskatchewan pay for it at source, but if there is a rebate, 
this year, it's because behind the scenes, quietly, the federal government remitted the, the provincial government remitted the money to the federal government, and therefore you're getting your rebate. Now, you might get your rebate, and you might have people from the Saskatchewan party going around all the province saying, "Ah, oh, we forced the federal government to give it to you." But <laughs> don't be fooled. If you do get a rebate this year, it's because quietly the provincial government slipped the money to the federal government, which means you paid it. And it just means that Premier Scott Moe and Dustin Duncan made it a hidden tax rather than one. Interesting. Huh? That's all, because the, 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 the federal government is not going to bend on this. No. And the federal government has been bending on this stuff when it comes to health care, for example, when they saw that how certain provinces were starting to bill for mm -hmm. certain things they shouldn't have, uh, the federal government cut the health transfers to those provinces. For so this reason. is a, yes, so this is a federal government that will cut transfers. So if Scott Moe thinks that the federal government won't do it, this and he'll get a win that way, and that's not going to happen. The rebates will be cut, and then there will be pressure from inside the province for him to do something. Now, on the other hand of the ledger, on the other side of the ledger, we've seen that seven premiers, all the conservative leaning ones, I don't know if it's all of them, pretty much all of them, and one it. liberal one. So seven out of 10 wrote all those letters to the prime minister, begging him to not put, a for, put forward this increase. While they're, sorry, I'll keep that aside, to not put forward this increase. But Wab Kanu, who's the premier of Manitoba, who is on the record as stating that he did not want this increase in carbon pricing to go ahead, did not join in that letter campaign. And it seems that there is a reason for that. And that's because Premier Canoe, it seems, is going to attempt to present to the federal government a made in Manitoba plan so that the federal backstop no longer applies there. Interesting. Yes. So when he when you hear these news saying that, oh my God, like even the Premier of Manitoba is going to be going to have a meeting with Justin Trudeau to ask him to make him exempt from the carbon price. Yes and no. <laughs> exempt. Yes, but not just because he's on the left of the political spectrum or has a winning smile or has infectious charm, mm -hmm. but because he intends to do his job as premier Which and is. present a made in Manitoba plan. Now, again, remember, kids, that we live in this tyranny and this dictatorship where the prime minister actually passed a law that allows the provinces to come up with their own plans so long as it meets some minimum criteria, and then the federal backstop won't apply. And it's only if premiers decide not to get off their duffs and do the bare minimum that is required so that their citizens don't have to pay it. Because either they don't want to wear it and they'd rather have just have something to blame the federal government for, or because they don't believe in it and they don't want to do anything, or they don't know how, or they're too incompetent, or they're too lazy, whatever the reason, if they're not doing it in-house, mm -hmm. then the federal backstop applies. So I don't know how many tyrants give people the choice to do things their own way <laughs> first. And failing that, then something applies. Usually in the history books that I've read, the tyrant usually just shows up and say, hey, you know what, this is how it's going to be. They don't turn around and say, eh, now that this is going to be, this is how it's going to be, uh, it, it, would you like to arrange for yourself how to, to make that easiest for yourself? No, it just usually because this is how it's going to be. We have a situation where people who will not do the work are basically claiming that the federal government is imposing this type of stuff on them that's making your life miserable, it's tyrannical, and won't work with the provinces in order to... No, he will work with the provinces. The whole inherent design of this program is that you get the first option. Provinces get the first option to decide whether or not the carbon backstop will or will not apply in their province. That is literally the definition of working collaboratively with provinces <laughs> to reach goals in a manner in which the province can lead the way. Yeah, it, just, it just has to meet certain benchmarks. 
He doesn't care how you meet the benchmarks. He doesn't even care if you tar- charge the, ta- the tax or the fee to the citizens. If the government of Saskatchewan doesn't want to charge the fee to its citizens, it does it. It just has to remit the money to the federal government. That would have been charged. Mm-hmm. Every province has full free reign to do something or not do something. Take your pick. Take your pick. But if you choose not to do anything, then don't complain that the backstop's going to come up. Mm-hmm. That's a choice you made. By choosing to do nothing, you chose the backstop. That's why when you're talking about New Brunswick in particular, for example, Blaine Higgs, there was an in-province scheme in New Brunswick. And then Blaine Higgs came along and stopped doing that. So then the federal backstop applied. And now he's campaigning against the federal backstop that he chose. (laughs) I just don't... I I can't some days. Uh, Come on, really? Like, it's like, if I was in New Brunswick, I'd be sitting here going, uh, he'd be at his rallies to talk about the federal backstop, blah, 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 contract. Like, Dude, you chose it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we Daniel. had a system. You could have continued it. You chose not to. Clearly, you thought the federal backstop was the better way. Boy, I tell you, if you are a conservative voter in Canada, mm-hmm. I swear, I, you have my sympathy, man. Yeah. Like, seriously. What do you got to vote for? Seriously. Come on. They are literally, they are treating you like you're stupid Mm -hmm. because they're getting, they want you to be mad at choices they themselves have made. Yeah. But then want to blame the federal government for it. For their choice. Yep. Kitlin M, same as Ontario, when Dougie did away with cap and trade. Yeah. Exactly. And at this uh, thing with uh, Scott Moe, which was great, there was the MP from the block. I can't remember her first name, Julie. Her last name escapes me at the moment. Julie from the block. To... Ah, Come on, I was waiting. Ah, I missed it completely. <laughs> Julie Vignola, her name is. Okay. And she made that. She's because these provinces turn around and often will compare themselves to Quebec and British Columbia. And blah, 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 they're, they're twisting what they're doing over there. And she reminded him in no uncertain terms. It's, Dude. Quebec is participating in the global carbon market with California, which uh, I'll remind you happens to be the wealthiest state in the United States. Yes. Which has been doing carbon regulation for a long time. This was the cap and trade system that Ontario was a part of, but decided to pull out of at a cost of billions and billions of dollars to Ontarians and to businesses because Mm -hmm. they had paid for all their credits for that year. And then the Ontario government just pulled that out and didn't compensate them for it. Yeah, yeah. No, we can't do they so loved them. They loved that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that system exists, and all the provinces are welcome to come in and join in it. <laughs> like this, and she's saying, "Hey, we've been part of this forever. Like this is bringing in like one point five billion dollars into our coffers every year without us having to charge a carbon fee." Because it's like you do know how stock markets work, don't you, sir? So are you afraid? Or are you against all stock markets or just the carbon one? <laughs> Because this potash and all these other things and lentils and pulses that you claim that Saskatchewan is producing at a greener rate than, in a more green way than everyone else, those get traded on stock exchanges, right? Mm-hmm. But a stock exchange for pulses or for potash works in Saskatchewan, but a stock exchange for carbon won't work in Saskatchewan. There's like this magnetic force field all around the province of Saskatchewan that makes it such that a stock market for carbon won't work in Saskatchewan. And that's essentially what Premier Scott Moe was saying in that testimony. He was saying certain solutions are well tailored for certain regions. It's like, yeah, it's a stock market. It's a global <laughs> phenomenon. Every nation in the world in some way participates in a stock market in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Directly or indirectly. But for carbon, a stock market won't work in Saskatchewan. That's something that might be a good idea in other provinces, but the way that Saskatchewan's arranged, a stock market won't work there. I can't make it up. No, I can't. I can't make it up. can't make it up. (sighs) These people. And this thing with Saskatchewan, I watched this. There's about like three hours and something of it. 
uh-huh. of meetings that day. So they had Scott Moe, and then they had Yves Giroux, and then I believe that there was a, another person that they had uh, coming to testify that day. And before Scott Moe could speak, and this is another thing that they did, is Scott Moe, you see, see it on his uh, Twitter feed and social media, after they tried to block me for speaking for the first half hour, then I could speak. And that what happened, because as we reported on the show, the premiers wanted a meeting at the Finance Committee, and the Finance Committee was not meeting, didn't happen. So they sent him to that, to the other committee, I think government operations, because government operations was, was studying the main estimates. So the budget, from what I could understand from the process, comes in two parts. Comes the main estimates, the basic cost to run things that happen year after year, and then what they call the supplementary estimates, which is the new spending that they will be doing that comes later. So they have the budget, they announce the new program that comes in, then the supplementary estimates come to committee and are debated. So right now they're debating the main estimates, and that happens before the budget basically all the, the basic fundamental operating costs that they would be paying anyway that comes through. So they're looking at that, and basically the chair committee said, we spend money on carbon stocks, so they appear in the main estimates, so that's why we're, I said yes to meeting on this. Now the problem that every other committee member had is because traditionally in this committee, at least for the last five years, any notice of meeting was done and any invitation for guests was done with the input and with the advice of the members of the committee. And the chair of this committee, who happens to be a conservative in this case, decided to bypass all of that and just unilaterally invite people. There are rules within the committee that if they're going to have a guest, that there's 48 hours notice given. And that's just not just a courtesy or not just, hey, we want to have this guest, what do you think? It's, as again, MP Julie Vignola made the point very well, and she was pretty much incensed about this. We need time to prepare our questions for our Mm. guests. Mm -hmm. And when you have a guest of such importance as a premier, because as I say on this show all the time, the most valuable asset that an elected official has is their time. And when you're a prime minister or a premier or a senator or a minister, that's even more. And you're bringing four premiers of four different provinces in over two or three days to give an hour to an hour and a half of their valuable time to ask them questions about stuff and you don't have time to prepare their questions in a manner that is respectful enough of their time. Mm -hmm. Then what's the point of bringing them in here? Yeah. Because it isn't certainly not to study the mains and it's not to study the issue because if it was, you wouldn't give us, you would have given us time to do research and prepare solid questions. Not just have to come up with them off the cuff of our head with 12 hours notice. This is a stunt. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the first half hour of the meeting was people raising points of order over and over and over again, which the chair was very arrogant. He wouldn't let people try to make the points of order. He would interrupt them like three seconds and says, that's not a point of order. That's not a point of order. Get to your point of order when people are trying to put a little context around the point of order. And at one point, even Premier Scott Moe got into it because uh, one liberal turned around and says, I'm sorry, Premier, I don't mean to interrupt. I just, and Scott Moe goes, but you are interrupting. And then Scott Moe was trying to get into the deliberations. It was like, no, Scott Moe, you're not the chair of this committee. You're the guest that's coming here to testify. When someone raises a point of order, your duty is to shut your mouth. Mm-hmm. Let the point of order be discussed not to try to back up the chair. Now, he stopped doing that after the first couple of minutes like this, but for the first couple of minutes, it was like, ah, dude, know your place here. (laughs) So yeah, the first half hour was them basically not trying to prevent Scott Moe from testifying because nobody said we should cancel this meeting today. We shouldn't do it. But they were trying to rake the chair over the coals for being disrespectful to his colleagues, to the other committee members like this, and technically to his guests, the premiers, by not allowing for proper preparation time for solid questions. Did his whole opening, and basically you make some opening comments when you come to testify, you're given a few minutes for that. And it seems that his main opening comment was never say never. Now, when he's talking about never say never, it's like, never say never to scrapping this increase of the carbon. And he vacillated. He wasn't very organized because every now and then, sometimes he was talking about scrapping this particular increase. But then he was saying, if we scrap the whole 17 cents, mm. you know, we look at the inflation data. People are saying that inflation in Saskatchewan is 1.7%, whereas it's 2.7%. 
everywhere else. And when that data came in, and we talked about it on the show where Saskatchewan was trying to first present that, as, that's because I stopped collecting the fuel taxes like this. I saved us a full 1%. And then people made the comments. And that's not what Statistics Canada said. Statistics Canada said this contributed. Now, they didn't say what percentage of contributed, like most of it went out. It just contributed to reducing that by an extra percent in Saskatchewan, which he did tell the truth about that. He did say contributed. It didn't say caused while he was in testimony. So he didn't lie about that. I'm guessing he got wrecked on the knuckles enough for having tried to get rid of again, trying to get away with that one. So you have the, they're trying to portray this as a really smart decision that they've done economically for the people that's saving them a lot of money uh, on inflation. And uh, that's not the case as well. So he's saying never say never with regard to, I know that the federal government said that they'll never do this, but never say never. He must've said never say never six or seven times in his first opening statement. But the irony of this is that he was saying, please never say never while he is saying never to doing anything. To wow. fight car. I, I, <sighs> never say never except me it was basically his position i get to say never but everyone else never gets to never say never and all the conservatives on the committee were trying to spin this narrative the liberals or the committee not wanting to hear from the people of saskatchewan one they weren't hearing from the people of saskatchewan they're hearing from the premier of saskatchewan which i understand he represents the people of saskatchewan but we weren't talking about everyday, ordinary Saskatchewan citizens or leaders of community organizations. We were talking about the premier, who we mentioned on a previous show, has a direct line to the prime minister and can call. Anytime he doesn't you have to account. He doesn't have to come to a committee and testify on behalf of all Saskatchewans for conservatives and the conservative movement to claim that the government has now heard from the residents of Saskatchewan because the premier went to a committee and testified the premier could pick up the phone anytime that the premier and the prime minister are together. Hey, the premier and the prime minister could have been together a couple of days ago when the prime minister was in Saskatchewan announcing the fact that $560 million had been transferred because they had come to an agreement on health. But premier Scott Moe decided not to show up to that signing because it was something that they did together that worked and therefore didn't want to be seen next to Trudeau with video of them agreeing and shaking hands and getting along and saying that something that Trudeau did was good. But had he shown up there, he could have talked to Trudeau again about carbon fees. Could have. Sure the chair of the committee, yep, chair of the committee is going, no, we had to do this now, we had to do this fast, we couldn't have the 48 hours thing because the price is going up on the 1st of April and we want to stop this price increase. So we had to do it now. You could have done that last month. Yeah. Or three months ago. It's not like they just woke up two weeks ago. Oh my God, there's a garbage fee. Ah, we need to do something. They've been bitching about this for years. There is no urgency. Lack of planning on your part didn't constitute an emergency on the rest of the committee's part. And this was a constituency week. So this chair prevented all of those MPs on that committee from going back into their constituencies and doing that work. Wow. By scheduling this meeting at the last minute while PAUS was not even in session. What a, what a, what a dick move. They strictly wanted the clips. Yeah, that's all. They strictly wanted the clips. Aaron O'Toole warned of this. He said, the party is trying to govern by social media and you cannot do that. But this is what they're doing. Anything they can get for a clip for social media. They get a win for five minutes, it gets a charge, and they get excited, and <sighs> democracy suffers as a result. Yep, exactly. So I'm just sent, I just sent something to Mr. Grizzly here with the timestamp, and it's, a bit, it's the, a bit of the conversation that I mentioned about the member from the Bloc Québécois. And again, kids and cubs, this is one of the reasons why I don't get upset that the Bloc Québécois is represented in Parliament, while well, a lot of people do. Because here you have a situation of a representative from a province, which is led by an ideological conservative government, Legon, mm. who also didn't sign the letter because the carbon backstop doesn't apply in Quebec because 
They have they're their on own. the carbon market. They have their own. But basically, she doesn't have a horse in this fight here. Mm-hmm. Her horse in the fight is that she wants to have Can- Canada have as tough carbon policy and pricing policy as Quebec does. That's her horse in the race. Because Quebec is competing with all the other provinces for business as well. Oh, yeah. So if all the provinces had a carbon system that was as equally as effective as that of Quebec's, then whatever temporary competitive advantage or disadvantage, depending on the sector that's going on at the time, because would be eliminated. Everything would be the same. So that would definitely be in the interest of Quebec. And Quebec is also all in on the climate thing, and mm-hmm. they would rather that all provinces be rowing together in the same direction. But other than that, she's got no horse in the fight, so she's got nothing to lose by being completely honest. And Quebec really is in on green energy in ways that I think the rest of Canada doesn't even grasp. If you drive anywhere in downtown Montreal, you will see electric car charging stations everywhere. Yep. There's street side everywhere downtown Montreal. Downtown Ottawa, the capital of Canada. We're supposed to set the example. I know of four in the downtown core. Four. One of them is street side, a couple of blocks away. The other three are inside parking garages. And one of the parking garages happens to be in the Rideau Center. Yeah. That's it. I only know of four. Oh, no, wait, no. Mm-hmm. Let's make that five. There's one at City Hall. So there's yep. two in my neighborhood. That's it. It's not good planning on Ottawa's part. No, not at Whereas all. Whereas Quebec, who they're Hydro-Quebec, I believe 100% of their grid is hydroelectric power, is it not? I'm not sure about 100%, but a lot of it. It's, it's my, way up there. Yeah, 90, 90, 95, something like that. It's really high. Uh, and they've been trying to get away from fossil burning fuels, burning fossil fuels for power for a long time. Yeah. Uh, but here's the thing about that. And this is one of the things that Premier Wapkanu is also going into this meeting with the federal government, touting specifically the hydroelectric. Because as we mentioned on the show, Manitoba is the province that has most of its, generates most of its electricity from hydroelectricity at the moment. So basically, Wapkanu is going, we've cleaned up our electrical grid. That's counting for part of the a big chunk of what it is that he's going to say has uh, met the equivalency. But in those provinces that are touting their hydro, they really need to be careful because if we're going to keep on having droughts, mm-hmm. that's a problem. At some point, that hydro is not going to work out for them anymore, and they are going to need other technology. Yeah. Which is why we need to invest more in nuclear. Which at, you remember when they had Greenpeace no nukes back in the seventies? That was the big thing, no nukes. And now the guy who started Greenpeace is for nuclear energy because of the fact that it is cleaner and greener than many other sources. And yes, it's expensive. And yes, there is waste that we can deal with, but it's cleaner and greener than many sources. And here's the other thing. Uranium is a plenty. So, you know. Indeed. Do we have the little clip set up? Yep. Uh, whenever you're ready, sir. Yep, let's play it carbon market alongside California, which is the wealthiest state of the United States in Quebec, the carbon market has put back in the coffers $1.5 billion. The Canadian provinces had the opportunity to join Quebec in that uh, carbon exchange uh, that uh, was not only good for the government coffers, but also for businesses, companies and corporations, because it stimulated innovation in those companies. At the end of the day, why did Saskatchewan make a different choice? And if Saskatchewan wants to get rid of the carbon tax, what steps will Saskatchewan take in order to reduce the impacts of climate change and to drive down uh, greenhouse gas emissions? You'll recall that the carbon tax is a similar measure to uh, one that was put in place in the past to uh, diminish or reduce uh, emissions. And we have 65% fewer emissions of sort of sulfur. And we'd like that to happen Canada-wide and in Quebec in particular, thanks to a uh, carbon marketplace. So why didn't you follow suit? 
uh, i.e. the carbon market or the carbon exchange, which is l lucrative in both the middle and short term. Great. We're out of time. If you could offer as short as answer as you can, please. This really speaks to the diversity uh, in our nation. What works in one area of the nation may not work ideally in another area of the nation. And, and I think this is a reason why uh, if you don't have a federal government that isn't working collaboratively with all sub-national governments across the nation, you are destined uh, to fail in your policy development. Uh, with respect to the carbon tax specifically, uh, we've always said that it's a, a harmful tax from day one. And uh, we've always also said outside of Quebec, uh, it's been reasonably fairly imposed, as harmful as, as it is across the nation. What we've seen more recently uh, with the uh, decisions on, on that impact uh, heating fuel in Atlantic Canada uh, is that, again, outside of Quebec, and uh, now this tax isn't being applied fairly across the nation or imposed fairly across the nation uh, in any way. And that's why we made the decisions uh, that we did uh, when it comes to home heating fuel for giving the carbon or re rebating the carbon tax on uh, natural gas and electricity. <laughs> All right, let's stop that. So that, that smarmy face you saw at the end was the chair. Now, you'll notice that the question was, why haven't you joined the carbon market? And what are you going to do to address it? In other words, he didn't answer either of those questions. Of course not. He said, what works in one region, that's the wonderful thing about the diversity. What works in one place doesn't necessarily work in another place. No, stock markets work everywhere. The carbon market works everywhere. So that's a lie. And then he was talking about, oh, darn. Should have made a note of it. Oh yeah, the why and the why and what of all of it. And while talking about, as you as I mentioned here, that the federal government, when it doesn't work with the provinces, so this was the answer that encompassed all the stuff that I mentioned before. It is, but as I mentioned, the provinces get the first option, which is the very literal definition of working with the provinces. So he didn't have an answer. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have an answer because this is not sound. If I'm going to give you another timestamp here, Mr. Grizzly, and this is a liberal MP that's named Francis Drouin, who had a, a very good intervention to make, uh, which I think it's worth hearing at this point. And here's one thing I will say is I don't tend very much to watch the committee stuff this particular one was actually fascinating, <laughs> to be totally honest. I, I definitely was not bored. Okay. Let's put it this way. But yeah, I thought that this was a, a really, you could tell that someone came prepared here. Your timestamp is not... Oh, sorry. Uh, what, sorry, yeah. Sorry. that Yeah, I, I had I a typo confused. there. One thirteen oh seven. Sorry. Okay. Yes, I, I, I typed 1 to I Mr. Chris. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Which is a hard time to find. <laughs> I, I don't know what that means. Uh, I'm you very all, confused. I do, all, I do all my own stunts and my own typing kits. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Premier Mo, as my father always taught me, when you point the finger, there's always three fingers pointing right back at you. And I know that you haven't reduced your provincial sales tax or removed the provincial sales tax on heating, uh, but I, I, I don't want to get into that, but I know for a fact that hasn't been done. I know that you haven't reduced income taxes. I've looked at year 2023 and year 2024. It's the same. And I know that it's important to talk affordability, but we have to, if you're going to point the finger at us, I think it's important to recognize that you also need to do something. Now, yesterday, the Prime Minister asked you to come up with a credible plan that will respect our Paris Accord. And you've said something today, um, which uh, I'm shocked, to be frank. Um, you're against the clean fuel regulations. Do you have canola farmers in Saskatchewan? Yeah, certainly. We have, we'd likely be one of the largest canola producing jurisdictions in the world and are advancing that into ultimately climbing that value chain with canola oil and significant investment, I would say, in canola oil manufacturing. The conversation around the carbon tax has been part of that investment challenge, I would say, but we are finding our ways through that. Are you okay. aware as Stop to the why they've made those such an... He only had to say yes or no. Yeah. Committee members have a certain amount of time. The rest of that was unnecessary. Let's keep going, Mr. Grizzly. One second. 
uh, investment challenge, I would say, but we are finding our ways through that. Are you aware as to the why they've made those such investments into Saskatchewan? And do you know there why are, the clean, the Canola Growth Council, the Canola Council of Canada, Canola Growers of Canada were all supportive of the clean fuel standards? Do you understand that? Do you know why? Because, poten what? because potentially they would use some of that oil uh, to reduce the emissions in the gasoline uh, that we are burning, are utilizing, and the families are burning across Canada. And there is some of that uh, conversation that is happening. However, uh, I think there is a, a much more uh, collaborative path forward on what will actually be achievable in this space. Uh, this is going to cause the cost of, uh, of gasoline to go up uh, for families. Uh, we are in the process as well at looking at should we be a feedstock uh, of transitioning really a food product to a fuel product uh, for places that are already have the clean fuel standard in place like California for example and so uh, that is an ongoing uh, conversation not in all states uh, throughout the US but an ongoing conversation in but, in Canada as well but in order to develop the local market that clean fuel standard is the regulation that allows canola farmers to sell more products for fuels that's an important policy that's why they've been so supportive of this particular policy now i, I want to go on to you you said you've participated to cop 28 uh I, i'm assuming that you're in favor of international trade yeah absolutely we trade with over 150 countries each and every year export uh, to them provide them with food security and fuel security and i'm assuming that you're also aware that many countries across the world whether it's europe the uk hasn't made this recent announcement you know what a carbon import tariff is? I am aware of what a carbon import tariff is. So do you know what the impact, if Canada does not have a price on pollution, how devastating that would be for our farmers in Canada and Saskatchewan? I know that there, we have a federal government that should be engaging proudly on behalf of the industries that are employing not only Saskatchewan residents, which I would remind everyone are Canadians as well, but all Canadians with respect to what we are doing in our industries today. As I said, the, the Saskatchewan story is not only in Saskatchewan. It, it, every province has a story uh, about what they are doing, how they are reducing their emissions in the industries that are employing people, creating wealth. And I would ask respectfully our federal government and all of those involved to take that story abroad. That's what we did at COP28. And that's what we continue to do through our uh, 10 uh, trade offices, provincial trade offices that we have that work alongside our high commission offices and our ambassador offices around the world, including uh, one in London and one in, the, uh, in Germany representing the European Union. No, I, and I certainly support the work that uh, Saskatchewan farmers are doing. I've been to their farms. They are uh, innovators. Uh, the University of Saskatchewan is doing some great work in terms of being able to measure that particular output. Um, but I'm just, I'm, I'm afraid that if we don't put a price on pollution, then we are not going to be competitive uh, in our exports market because eventually what's going to happen is that jurisdictions that do not have a price on pollution will be slapped with an import tariff. I don't yeah. see how that could be advantageous to our Canadian farmers. Yeah, and I, and I rival that concern uh, with uh, the, the, the federal government making these policy decisions that are going to put our national and I would say our continental food and fuel security at risk. Um, and that is exactly what we saw happen. And that's why European I'm pleading Union. with you to come up with a, a regional plan that makes sense for Saskatchewan. Absolutely. If you want to exempt farmers, we that's did. up to we you. Did. But a regional no, approach is much better than a federal approach. No. I'm just the, the prime did. minister asked you to come up with a plan. So yeah. I'm pleading with you, come up with a plan that makes sense for Saskatchewan farmers. Thank you. We All right, we could we stop that. Thanks, I do. See, now you saw at the end, Scott Moe was completely flummoxed because at the end, when Drouin was stating, because I am begging you to come up with something. <laughs> he kept on trying to see him speak over Drouin so he couldn't make the point. And at the end, when the time was over and he was finished, and he said, well, where, where we are. Now, in there, he was asked specifically if he understands the concept of import tariffs, and this is a point that we keep on making on the show. This, if you don't do the stuff that's needed to be done at home to reduce your carbon imprint, because all of these people are going there and they're talking about, if we want to reduce global emissions, then let's just export our LNG to countries that are using dirtier fuels, and we will help to reduce global emissions. This is a deviation of topic. We are not talking about reducing global emissions. Yes, we are in general. But what we are talking about when it comes to Canada 
and our own obligations is reducing GHG emissions created in country. And that's the thing that conservatives do not want to do. They do not want to do that. They want to, for example, displace dirtier forms of carbon and then claim the credit for that reduction as a being a Canadian initiative because we produced the energy and for it to not be create, not credited as an initiative of the country that actually made the choice to buy the energy and replace dirtier energy with cleaner. The conservatives want you to believe that we live in a world that if China decided to shut down 100 coal plants tomorrow and fuel them all with LNG from Saskatchewan and Alberta, that Saskatchewan and Alberta would get the global credit for reducing GHG reductions from that switch and not China. And that China would be okay with that. No, we don't need the credit for that effort that we made. We just transformed everything. We put all the money in converting everything from coal like this. But Saskatchewan, you take the credit because you supplied us the gas that we can use now in this whole system that we just switched over mm -hmm. at great cost to us. It's not going to work that way. When you have Danielle Smith coming in front of the camera, remember her bold big thing a couple of months ago is, I don't believe in fantasy thinking. This is fantasy thinking. This is literal fantasy thinking. And let's remember also that before that is done, this, we have to discover the LNG that would be required because we're already maximum producing at our capacity. We'd have to build extra capacity to produce extra refineries and then sign a contract. And that's five to 10 years out. And what do we do in those five to 10 years? Nothing. Because that contract is coming any day now. Mm. And we'll get the credit for it. Wink. It's li these are all kick the can down the road, delay. The opposite of never say never. Yeah, let's not worry I, about This is, that. I am saying never. Our grandchildren <laughs> using, have to worry about this, not us. Yes, <laughs> just, just without, yeah, just without using the word never. Yeah. Let's replace it with carbon capture and storage. Let's say we've only been researching that since 2008 or something. We've just put $1.3 billion in subsidies so that we can introduce it more, but it's not ready. We don't have the technology there. And once we get it, then again, as I keep on mentioning, we'd have to deploy it and make sure that all companies have it as soon as possible, which would require government money. And when it comes time to put in that in place, that would mean that shit's getting really real with replacing oil with something else. And it's got to be replaced. I don't know, man. I do not know. I do not know. They're not serious. If they Absolutely. were saying, if they were saying technology, but they were saying, but until that technology is here, we need to do something in the meantime. And here's the mitigating factors that we would use. Yes. But their policy is we don't need to do nothing because one day we will have technology. You can't bank on that. You can't bank on that. If he understands what import tariffs are, he surely didn't seem to indicate that he did understand them. Because the question is, what are you going to do as premier of your province to ensure that you produce all these wonderful products that you say that are very being produced in a green efficient way and that are exported to 150 countries all around the world? What are you going to do to make sure that there's not an import tariff? And he turned around and says, well, that's why the federal government doesn't know. <laughs> That, that's your job, sir. That's literally your job. It says, and gee, the federal government, when it goes abroad, they could certainly be telling the whole world the story about what it is that we do to reduce the emissions when we produce our pulses and our potash and stuff like that. Do you think they're, they don't? Mm. Do you think that they don't go there with all their success stories? That's why they have all those briefing notes and whatnot where they ask people like to submit something and so they can have all that information. They make that case. Oh, yeah. They make that case. But at the end of the day, do you have a price on pollution? And are you taking steps to reduce your GHG emissions? That's the only people, that's the only thing people care about in this debate. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff, that's nice and that's great. And it's wonderful. 
It's more ethical. It's more this. It's like, yeah, that, that's nice. Are you reducing your GHG emissions? That, that's the basic price of admission here. You can sing, you can dance, you can flap your arms, you can wear silly costumes, you can serenade us. You can do, now don't take your eye off this hand while this hand is doing something else. You can do all of that. If at the end of the day, the people with the calculators counting the beans say you didn't reduce your GHG emissions, <laughs> you're going to have a tariff. You're going to have fewer countries to which you could export your things. And that is going to affect your farmers. The people that you say you're fighting for. You're going to make their products less exportable. You are going to reduce demand. Only the other countries that decide not to participate in this fight will be willing to buy your products. And you will not be getting top price. And here's the irony. So we just spent 34 freaking billion dollars building that Trans Mountain Pipeline so that we could get the top price for the oil. You're not going to do what you need to do to get top price for your potash or your pulses. Yeah. But do, do we need the federal government to come up and build a pipeline for your pulses too? <laughs> in your potash center? Like, come on, man. We are living in a country where our premiers will not do the minimum. And whether that is on environment or on health or whatnot, to make sure that they fulfill their main obligations, and then they ask for the federal government to come in with more money. They won't build houses. They won't educate you. They won't provide for your health. They won't make sure that the air is good enough to breathe during the summer. No big deal. They turn around and say, why isn't the federal government solving this? While at the same time saying the federal government's spending too much money. They need to balance the budget. But please boost our health care by $35 billion. And please raise military spending to 2% of GDP. That extra says, says 63 to $75 billion a year will take to do that. But balance the budget. Conservatives are not good with money, kids. Clearly. They just aren't. Oh, man. And then at the end of the committee, because after Eve testified, then they went back into committee and they were trying to debate the next day's meetings, which was the meeting that which Blaine Higgs and Daniel Smith showed up. And they were trying to, first of all, they passed a motion, all the members that now rather making it a convention, making it now committee policy that they need to get 48 hours notice. All the conservatives voted against that, of course, to the committee members. And for some reason, nobody wanted to debate the issue with regard to the meeting of the following day, how it was going to happen. And it just del delved in from points of order to points of order to points of order while people were making false claims about each other. So basically the end of this meeting it was essentially point of order. I got a, somebody said two words, uh, point of order. Somebody would say two words, point of order. And the chair got so upset and flustered and pissed off at it that he says, you know what? We're just suspending and put the gavel. <laughs> enough of this crap, basically. Enough of this crap. Because, and they didn't get the agreement to what they needed for the meeting of the next day, which still did happen because we have the clips of Higgs and Smith testifying. So the conservative chair of this committee does not have control of this committee in <clears throat> any way, shape, or form. Clearly. Any way, shape, or form. And he stood at that chair, stood, sat at that chair, and smugly just basically said, we're discussing main estimates, and carbon fees are in main estimates. So that's why I called this meeting, and I felt it was my responsibility to be able to call this meeting unilaterally and invite these guests unilaterally with no notice and no input from all of you like we have been doing for the last five years. This is somewhat tangentially related to the budget. So therefore, and we discussed things. So, and they were saying, like, we've got 12 decision points to make today on transport on this. None of these have to anything to do with carbon pricing. So it's, it's like, these guests' time is valuable. But it, did Mr. Mo come prepared to give us his thoughts on uh, postal rates? Today, can we ask him about that? Because that's what's on the agenda to be discussing today. <laughs> the chair basically just hijacked the entire purpose of those two days meetings unilaterally. And I was allowed to do that. Now, there was this one guy 
on uh, the conservative scent. Who I believe his might have been Lamoureux, his last name is? I, 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 no, probably not. I've got that wrong. Um, These things happen. Yeah. He was, here we go. I'll give you a time stamp. When I tell you that the conservatives are trying to Americanize our politics, so it's at 2.56.07, I think. We often see clips of what goes on at committee hearings in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. Where the Republicans, rather, they, they've got five minutes and they spend two and a half minutes asking a question formulating a first question that has a whole bunch of leading things and accusatory ac ac lies and accusatory statements and mm -hmm. right the opposite of an actual like cross-examine type question which is why i liked francis Drouin because you do understand what an import tariff is and that's a clear yes or no question that the premier should just say yes or no to and then they can move on so he was trying to frame his questions short and punchy like a cross-examine cross-examination cross but the premier was not uh, cooperating because he clearly saw what was going on here but making these big emotional statements and having these big outbursts so that you can have your clip uh, on committees warm. you have your permanent members but if a member is not there they can be subbed out or subbed in with someone else this person was a sub in and the reason why this committee, the chair had lost control of the committee, was because this guy was sent in with a script to read. And at the end of the meeting, while they are trying to determine the parameters of the next meeting, he comes in with a point of order and starts reading a statement, a very long one, all CPC propaganda, which is what kept on raising all the points of order. People say, point of order, mm -hmm. this is not a point of order, and it's not relevant at all to discussing when it is we're going to set the meeting, and then the chair would go and says, we give a wide latitude to this committee, and then boom, and just allowed him to continue. And these points of orders, this guy was interrupted easily 15, 20, 20 times, 25 times. And the chair just comes up, we give a wide, and would just allow him to continue reading that statement. So then the points of order kept on coming faster and faster because everybody else had basically caught on and wasn't going to allow this guy to read a statement. And that's what got the chair all frustrated. Then he just was, well, fine, then I'm just going to cancel the meeting. This is the party that believes in free speech. Only if it falls in line with what they want to hear. Yes. Their own free speech to hijack a meeting to make it of whatever they want and then to spend at least 30 minutes, maybe not 30, let's say 15 to 20, mm -hmm. so I might be exaggerating, minutes, having some person who's not a regular member of the committee but had just come in to sub in to read an entire statement that was the party's propaganda line on this thing mm -hmm. rather than discussing when the next meeting was. All these people that are there on a day that they're supposed to be in their constituencies working for a meeting that was called at the last minute that was not scheduled, that they all made time for. Mm -hmm. And this guy is standing there going like this, we've got premiers and premiers are important. I can make time for my schedule for that. It's not about not wanting to make time for his schedule. I can make time to hear about the hear from the people of Saskatchewan. It wasn't about that either. It's about respecting the way that things are done. If we'll play this clip, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll, it'd be very clear that this guy was sent in to be the Jim Jordan. An agent of chaos. Yes. Thank you very much. And I, I think that it's important to to put some context into into the meeting today. When we look at the carbon tax, uh, we heard today testimony from the PBO. We've heard testimony from the governor of Bank of Canada, uh, both nonpartisan experts in their respective field. That the, car that the carbon tax is, in fact, causing individuals to go hungry. It's causing children to not be able to eat at night and go to bed hungry. This is a significant issue. And so my understanding of it, and I could be wrong, I have no inside information, but my understanding of it is that the premiers wrote to the finance committee and asked before the April 1st, when the carbon tax is set to increase by 23%, we don't have much time here, so we can postpone and live in an imaginary world where this doesn't exist, but it does. We have April 1st deadline. They wrote to the finance committee, the liberal finance committee, and he deemed it, he deemed it 
that it was inappropriate that somehow the premiers, that millions of Canadians should not have a voice, that we should just all sit here and watch children not be able to eat at night because it might upset our schedule? Are you kidding me? How out of touch? Hey, we are, we are here. Hey, yeah, but uh, that... hold on. What about I'm everyone to just to get I'm down sorry, with that. but je ne mangeais pas ma... je ne mangeais Listen. I missed meals, sometimes a whole day's meals and the carbon tax didn't exist back then. Now is the ta carbon tax really doing all of this? Can we get back to brass tacks? It's important to hear from premiers, but it's important to not use them as political pawns. And I would like to put people on notice in that regard. Thanks. Before we continue, we just remind everyone of your voice levels with our interpreters, please. My Mr. apologies, Lawrence, to, please. Yeah, my apologies to the interpreter. But I'm not apologizing for my comments because they represent the reality. We heard today from the public, from the from the parliamentary budget officer that the carbon tax is increasing food, Bullshit. We're facing an affordability crisis. I met yesterday with a single mom, as a couple kids, who's who's more whose mortgage eats up her entire paycheck. So she has to use a food bank. This is not a laughing matter. This is serious, guys. And premiers wrote to the Finance Committee, and the Liberal chair decided that their voice wasn't important, that the millions of Canadians that they represent didn't count. And so, yes, our chair followed political proper parliamentary procedure and called a meeting so that the premiers the leaders of millions of Canadians could testify from New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, from Saskatchewan, from Alberta. I'm sorry that we had to move around our schedules. I know that we're all very busy, but millions of Canadians want to express their view that the carbon tax is hurting families and it's hurting Canadians. And yes, I don't think it's asking too much for 12 members of Parliament to move around their schedule for their voices to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else uh, wish to speak on this? Sorry, is Mr. Be yeah, I'll get you. Yeah, I'll get to Mrs. McNoll and Mr. Lawrence. Did we? Sorry, did we get Mr. Backrack checked in? Are you joining us? And we're losing Mr. Bullerays. Hi, Mr. Chair. I unfortunately I don't have my headphones. But you, um, okay, we'll recognize thumb up or down, thumb down for you then. Thanks. Yeah, Mrs. McNoll and then Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Lawrence, I met Sonic. I'd like Mr. Lawrence to put on his headset because previously, <laughs> before I put my colleague on notice regarding the fact that we don't need, it doesn't have to be just due to a carbon tax that uh, people can't pay their rent or they have to skip meals because I actually did both of those things for years and there wasn't a carbon tax back then. But honestly, we need to be respectful towards our witnesses. We need to really dive deep into the issues that they're experts on before we question them. It's not just a matter of having people showed up who've been calling on, to, who've been asking to see us for months. It's a matter of respect towards the witnesses. I know that the 1st of April is on the horizon and it's not April Fools here that I'm referring to. But the fact of the matter is, we need to be respectful towards our premiers, their, their valuable time, which is just as invaluable as ours is, if not more, and the, whether it be a premier from another, from a Canadian province or, or the province of Quebec, they have a, a hell of a lot of responsibilities. And so we need to be respectful towards them. I don't think that my 80-hour shift of per week suggests that I'm lazy and the reason I'm speaking now against having these meetings is because I'm lazy. It's not about that. I work hard. It's a, it's a matter of respect to those witnesses that we have before us. And we also have teams that are working in the background and we're continuously keeping their nose to the grindstone, leaving them in panic mode when really we should be more respectful towards them and towards the witnesses. None of this should be rushed through. I just wanted to put that on the record. I'm ready to vote whenever you see fit. She was not having it. No, she was not having it at all. Yeah. <laughs> you can see how he was going full Republican, right? Like, just, yeah. the children don't eat and do like this. He voted against the National Food Program for Children.
Exactly. Inserting all the lies and all the PBO said this and PBO said that and blah, blah, blah. And all that kind of thing. Literally didn't. Then had his emotional outburst. And I yeah. guess the Black Quebecois MP accurately reminded him, before I was an MP, there were days I didn't eat. And that was before the carbon tax. This is not yeah. a new thing here. That's not the thing that's stopping people to eat. This is, says, as an MP, I put in 80 hour weeks. So don't you sit there calling me lazy because I'm objecting to the manner this was done and not trying to claim that I wasn't willing to make time out of my schedule to meet a premier. I'm the one here that's complaining that we're respect, we're, not, we're disrespecting their time and treating them like pawns. I wish she had to hit him with two things. The, your party voted against a national food program for school children and you voted against $10 a day daycare. Oh, you also voted against pharmacare and dental care. But now you're going to whine about three cents on a liter of fuel? Duplicitous. Two-faced, yeah. duplicitous, just horrible individuals. Yeah, indeed. That's that, that was basically the committee stuff. I'm assuming that it probably won't be much better for Mr. Higgs and Miss Smith. A couple of clips I saw from Miss Smith show that the sheep got a bit of a rough ride too, from what I can see. But that will give you a general idea of the tone and tenure, tone and tenor of what went on. And you could see how the conservatives, once again, are abusing of our parliamentary process in order to do PR, in order to stage stunts, in order to get clips, in order to frame melodramatic moments. Oh my God. And then being able to run with them. Remember, that guy is not a normal part of that committee, which may explain why he got a lot of these facts wrong. Yeah. Because he wasn't there for all of it. He was just sent to sub in. All right. So that's the carbon stuff. Um, that is the carbon stuff. My goodness Mr. gracious. Yes. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, it seems that uh, we have, uh, we're going to take a little pivot on this episode. A little pivot on this episode, yes. We All right. A, we have a guest that we had talked about last week. We're going to try and get in today. And luckily enough, he's here. Ladies and gentlemen. Boys and girls, children of all ages, he, her, these, her, they, them, and everybody watching and listening. I want to introduce you to a buddy of mine who we met, oh God, must be eight, ten years ago, I think. And he's really good friends with a photographer friend of mine, Laura, who is a concert photographer. And those of you who live in the Ottawa environment, environs would be well familiar with her work because she's at every show and in the pit shooting all the time. And Super Kyle is usually in the pit too. Super Kyle crowd surfs. Matter of fact, he crowd surfed onto the stage at Blues Fest at Alexis on Fire when they played. And it was really cool. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, children, Zizer, he, her, they, them, us, dudes. This is my buddy, Super Kyle. Good morning, Good morning sir. How you doing? Hey, how are you? Hey, hey. Nice to see you. You as well. Good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It was good to see oh. you all the other day. Yeah, yeah. It was it Thursday we bumped into one another, I think. Oh, yeah. we lost your camera feed there. My goodness. There we go. Everything yeah, you're back. Happened today. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, what, I bumped into you, what, Thursday, I think it was? Right out in front of the office. I was just on my way to lunch, and we just happened. I'm like, Super Kyle. He's, so we had a nice chat. And uh, one of the things we talked about, which, because you're a, uh, what would you say, mobility advocate? Mobility advocate, accessibility advocate. I just want to remove the idea that people are disabled. I mean, people Agreed. Are brain. I, I hate that idea agents. that it's the human being that's at fault. And at the end of the day, so you met me because I went to a paratranspo event, tried to, to rally a couple of city councillors to, to take paratranspo with people. And the same four councillors showed up that always show up sort of thing. The rest of them weren't able to make it and but that would be the last time working with that group for me i've decided to go out and do my own crazy stunts and do the same thing again because i figure maybe this time i'll crowd surf a little band that might be coming to town and hang out with them for a sec but and you've also done the repel thing too correct i have i've done the yeah i've done repelling it was great <laughs> took my wheelchair down i did it like four times i think it was yeah. a funny time yeah. I haven't yeah. done that because I'm like, and here's the funny thing. I've worked at height. I've got my, all those working at height certificates and all that. I've been up poles. I've been up towers. I've done all that stuff. 
the repelling thing I'm just a little, a little nervous about, which is weird because I work at heights. It doesn't trouble me at all. The repelling thing I'm a little nervous about, and you did it in a wheelchair, dude. Forget Let me tell it. you a little secret that I don't know if I told anybody ever. Me too. I am. Too. Oh, really? Really? I am. Every oh. time it gives me that little bit of a rush. Mm-hmm. And but I guess I'm an adrenaline junkie. I've been dropped while crowd surfing. That was yeah, broken yeah. a leg, as a, I'm sure you've seen. Mommy loves me, Pookie Bear, and, and the whole thing. Whatever rush I can get into, a hundred percent. Okay. I'm, I'm yeah, in. yeah. You but you were mentioning earlier on that you wanted to uh, break the concept, getting people to not mm-hmm. think in terms of disabled. And you were talking about the that <laughs> event that you asked the counselors to show up on Power Transpo with you. What what happened? Because you said you've moved away from that and you're doing your own stuff. So like the four counselors showed up, the rest of the usual suspects did not. And what was it about that moment that caused you to say, you know what, I'm making a break here? It was just working in a group, working with parties that were not seemingly as organized as I had hoped they'd be. Mm-hmm. And these are people who have been, who continue to remind me that they've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, we've been doing so. I've been at this battle for about five years, mm-hmm. and the day I stepped in, we found out why Paratranspo hadn't gotten online booking yet because there was a delegation that said no. So we asked why they said no because there was an unfair booking system <coughs> because there was a limit to the number of rides they they would allow people to have. So let's say, for example, they'd only allow a thousand rides on paratranspo for all of the the people in the service per day, for example. We made them open that up. Yeah, how hard is that? How hard is it to put a little bit more money to take people who have no other op like this is an OC right. tra- This right. is paratranspo where right. a lot of people don't have the freedom to get in their buddy's car. Mm-hmm. Right. And <clears throat> this is a guy who has the freedom to get in the buddy's car advocating for this service. Like I have that freedom. And when it comes down to it, all I said was open that up and make this accessible. I mm-hmm. asked them, I said, the service used to be only between 6 a.m. and 12 a.m. And then they'd say, oh, um, we, we can only serve, uh, serve people between those hours. And I said, why is that? Why can't I go out to a show? Mm-hmm. Shows end at 11. I said, not local shows. No, they don't. No, they, no, they don't. don't. As I learned a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, open this up. And that was without the group. And that was, so I went out, I worked without the group for a while. I came back to the group and I said, let's try again. Let's see what we can do. (laughs) We did that event. Excuse me. It's going to be a coffee morning. Sorry. Um, I I, I did the, the, the group thing again and people weren't organized. So I said this time, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and put the, the group work down. I'm going to go crowd surf, maybe hopefully talk to somebody else again. And I left that event. And two seconds later, I run into this guy who said, come into my podcast. And I'm here I am today. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Now, why is it important for you to get people to not think in terms of disability? Why do you think that this is the path forward? I really think that someone sees a wheelchair and I say it that way because they see a wheelchair and they go, Oh no, that person is broken because Mm. to them, if they were to need use of a wheelchair, they would be losing something in their life. Right. Then you take someone like me who has always used a wheelchair his whole life. I was sorry, mom. I think I was bored out of the womb in a wheelchair and that is my comfort zone. That Mm -hmm. is just where I I used to walk with crutches and braces. And over time, I also gained MS. I was born with spina bifida. Gaining MS made me lose the walking and whatever. Mm -hmm. But the walking, my walking was never my biggest. I still have the ability to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I've always seen it is, can you repel down a building? Yes. Are you doing a wheelchair? Yes. It's still repelling. Yeah. Are you skating? Yes. Are you sitting down to do it? Yes. That's still skating. Yeah, because you play sledge, of... right? Exactly. I, my sledge hockey is, when I lost that, when I was dealing with, with medical problems for a mm. while. I, I was dying inside. Oh, yeah. yeah. Got it back a few years ago, and you've seen. Mm-hmm. 
right? That for me is what really drives me. And shirt uh, that you're wearing, right? Absolutely. No such thing as can't. Yes, and sir. Stack, no such thing as can't. No and that was your mom can't. who said that yeah. to you when you were quite young, right? It was mom. Yeah. yeah. It, it was mom, oddly enough, trying to get me to make my bed. <laughs> she sent me to go make my bed. I was like four or five years old. And she goes, honey, we're going to le learn something new today. And I go, what's that, mommy? And she goes, I need you to go make your bed for me. Do you remember how mommy does it? Yeah. So I go make my bed and try putting a fitted sheet on while you're sitting on it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So I go back to her, tears rolling down my face. And I go, mommy, I can't do it. And so she, ha she ha has me write down the words I can't. And I copy them out, trace a word. And, and then she goes, what does it say? I can't. And then she goes, Kyle, can you erase that T for me? And that's why I raised the T and it was like magic. I can't. Boom, five years old. I can't. And just right from there, all you have to do is find a way. That's the thing, right? Just find a way to make it happen. Find a way to make it work. Not that's everything has to be done in the same manner for every single person. Find a way. And removing the barriers, because there's so damn many of them still to this day, even though we'd like to think that we're a progressive nation and, and, and Ottawa being Canada's capital, we should be the most progressive, right? We let's should. remove barriers. Let's remove things. Let's get ramps in. And, and so much of what's done, it was because of the efforts of Rick Hansen, right? He brought right. awareness that we were not aware of. I was in grade seven. We were doing a book report and they said, go pick up a, at a book, any book, whether it's figure fiction that, that interests you. Mm -hmm. And that was a time in my life where I still wanted to hide, quote unquote, because I was still walking a lot, mm -hmm. hide the fact that I used the wheelchair as much as I could and put it aside. And people knew I, I used it a bunch, but at the same time, hide the fact that I was stuck in my wheelchair. Because all you heard, all you hear still today is wheelchair bound. And I look at those people and I go, if I was bound to this thing, I wouldn't have fallen out of it to crowd surfing for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't go, I wouldn't have gone keister over at Headstones. I didn't break my life as, but people are comfortable with these words. And yeah. so I was so afraid of that 12 years old going, is this my life? And then I'm going through the library about like inspirational stories and that sort of thing. And someone, one of my teachers said, you should check out this book. And it, it might've been, even been the librarian and it was a Rick Hansen hard copy hmm. and I ended up borrowing one from a family friend, finishing the book and just going, I have to meet this guy. Yeah. Six years later, I got to meet that guy. Nice. And, uh, Neat. yeah, yeah. Nice. what an amazing person. Absolutely inspirational human being. And for those of you who do not know, because many people aren't aware of this, he was good friends with Terry Fox. Terry Fox. He was really good friends with Terry Fox. And he actually helped motivate Terry Fox to do the Marathon of Hope. He got him into yeah. running because <laughs> Terry was, he didn't think he could. And Rick was like, you can do anything you want. So he was largely the inspiration for the Marathon of Hope. And then, of course, he had the Man in Motion World Tour where he had some difficult days on that trek, but he did it. He went around the world in his chair to prove that you can do anything. And then, again, for people that don't know, Rick ended up uh, having a car accident. Mm -hmm. and that's how he ended up. And But that's the story of someone who, well into their life, mm -hmm. found themselves in a different situation on, mm -hmm. and decided, I'm going to roll with the punches. Yeah. We're almost 40 years after, I think we're, this is the 40th year after the uh, run or whatever. I wasn't alive when it happened, unfortunately. I would have been, that would, that would been good. I, I was alive for the anniversary. That was yeah. good, but no. At the end of the day, he is an inspiration to a lot of people, and he knows it. And the fact that he knows it is it just makes him all the more humble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he realizes the responsibility that goes along with it. Yeah, big time. When you become the de facto voice for for want of a better term, a marginalized <laughs> section of society, because as evidenced by Paratranspo, only a thousand trips, that's it. I'm like, what, what? You, you are limiting people. Yeah. Take the limitations yeah. away and you can do anything. Yeah. No, I, I can't say exactly how many it was, but at the end of the day, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And, yeah. and, and then people were limited between 6 a.m. and 12 a.m. And then they had to basically, please, sir, can I have some more yes, to yeah, go yeah, out? Yeah. Went past midnight and it was like, what, am I going to turn into a pumpkin now or what's going on here? And uh, so 
Well, you got people going, disabled, disabled people don't go to concerts or bars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. They're at home and after 7 p.m. Where yeah, do they, they go? They expect you to be a monk, basically, right? Not have a life, not have, not want or, or desire to do any of the things that the rest of us, in air quotes, do. And that's bullshit. We're all humans. We all feel and need and want the same things. But yeah, they're, they're, they were trying to marginalize a group of society and they were putting limitations on them. And I was like, that is just bloody well wrong. Yeah. By every metric that is wrong. Why are we limiting people? That's why I believe in DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Equity makes it a level playing field, not even a level playing field. It gives everybody the ability to be at the same level. Yeah. See what we can do with that. Let's make it more accessible to everyone. Because if everybody is able to access it, you can prove to us what you can do and show that you aren't limited by, you're not your chair. You're in your chair, but you're not your chair. No, I'm not. And, and, and that's it. I was the guy getting out of his chair, pulling it up the three steps and getting back in on the old buses. Yeah. Just to be able to go and see his girlfriend at Colonel Bly. Yeah. That sort of thing. And to be able to get to work, I I took the, finally, they, they started having the kneeling buses and whatever. I took the city bus to get to Red Lobster when I worked there when I was a, a teenager. Mm -hmm. I think I quit there by, by 21. I think I stopped. But it was nice to have that sort of freedom. Mm -hmm. And I, when I realized, oh my God, why does the city, this city bus have all this freedom? And I don't have all this freedom on paratranspo. I have to, to book this far in advance. But back then it was, again, please, sir, can I have some more? Yes. And I was afraid of that. I was afraid of uh, all these things. And there's still a lot of people. And this is why we, we need more. We, we need more voices. Mm -hmm. And they're afraid. They're afraid of losing the service, which it's a city service. We're not going to lose it. So no, it's not going anywhere. We're going to throw that idea out the window. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to paratranspo they they had a they had the strike they had mm -hmm. the strike yeah uh, i think it was like 2008 or something like yeah. that yeah yeah quite a while ago uh, during the know, winter uh, too a it was like winter. a six week strike or something too yeah. right it was like a long one yeah and you know what if you're going to have this in the middle of summer more people are going to be able to get out mm -hmm. and do, do whatever but when they do that in the middle of winter you lock it. You lock people in their homes. Yes, you have flat, flat out. You're locking people in their homes. You're saying you don't deserve to to go out. There's people who don't have or people on government assistance, which is like at maximum maximum thirteen hundred dollars a month. Yeah, that, that that would cover my rent, and I'd be able to eat some food. I don't know if I'd be able to pay hydro, and that would cover your rent because you have been renting for a little while. Yeah. That's yeah. right. I've been in this place for 14 years. Yeah. 18 year olds that are just coming out into the world and nope. in their start. No, nope. doesn't that's cover not their... covering anything. No. And so a lot of people are still living at home. A mm -hmm. lot of parents are still covering whatever. And I understand with the economy, a lot of people are, are... but when yeah. you have that minimum wage part-time job, it, it still pays, pays more. ODSP pays get this full time seven dollars and fifty cents an hour Jesus so Christ. we haven't seen that since 2006 something like that it's been a long yeah. time since the, the the minimum wage was at that level yeah and so yeah they can't uh, even get it up to current minimum wage standard come on again but there, there's again that thing right disabled people don't need to go out they don't watch concerts they don't need to make yeah. them at least minimum wage what are they going to spend the money on yeah exactly exactly and, like that's, and as Kid Jim keeps on saying, even you know, marriage, there's the way the disability programs work shows that there's no such thing as marriage equality too. Because if you're receiving ODSP, yeah. your partner's all the hook for you. Yeah, yeah, which, yep. which is bullshit. Yeah, yeah, Alan's right. ODSP is criminal. It, it is. is. It's keeping. It's purposely keeping people below the poverty line, below yep. it. Yeah, she's a good last name. I like her last name. 
<laughs> good, good catch. I wonder why. I, I don't have my glasses on now. I can still see that. That's good. We were when we bumped into each other the other day. I was chatting with you about how I think one of the big issues, one of the, and it's a big concern for me. And again, I'm, I'm six foot, relatively fit individual, and occasionally I'll be carting equipment to a job site or set up for a remote podcast, and I'll have it on a cart, and everything's tied down, and I'm struggling to get it up the sidewalk and to the location <laughs> because the sidewalks are so beat to living hell. But let's not even talk about the winter. The bike lane is plowed. The street might not be plowed. The sidewalk has definitely not been touched, but the bike lane is clear. So people walk in the bike lane. Okay. So if I had to cart something in the winter, I could use the bike lane because the bike lane is a block away from where I live. That's okay for me. But what if you don't live anywhere near the bike lane in the winter time? The sidewalks yeah. don't get plowed. They eventually do, but not right away. Bike lane's done right away. And nobody's using a bike in the bike lane, by the way. <laughs> but the sidewalks are in such terrible shape that I have to struggle to get a, a, a tool bag or a cart or something with wheels on it to where I'm going. And if I'm struggling with this, what's it like if I have a walker, a cane, or I'm in a chair? So I was like, we got to get this shit fixed. This is wrong on so many levels. We're we're creating barriers where there needn't be one. It's the bloody sidewalk. That should not be a barrier. But it is for so many people. <laughs> so I'm going to have to get uh, our counselor, Ariel Troster, on here someday to talk to her about that because that falls under her responsibility because it's I'm in center town. And there you go. Exactly, Mohan. A stroller as well. Trying to push a stroller on city sidewalks. Yep. Brutal. Brutal. And you know what? And I, Ariel is actually one of those people that was, that showed up to the, the, the meeting. So well, I know she's a good Ariel, person. Ariel is a good person. Yeah. Yeah. I've met her a couple of times. I've chatted with her. Matter of fact, we, she was campaigning and we were actually recording a, a show at the time <laughs> and she knocked on my door and I said, yeah, no, you got my vote. Don't worry about that. She goes, Oh, and she saw the studio. She goes, what? I go, yeah, we're recording a podcast. Oh, really? What kind? Oh, it's a political show and general culture. I'd like to get you on someday. But it yeah. hasn't happened yet. We'll reach out to her and see if we can get her on to discuss it. Because we have the money's there. Let's fix it. Let's make it happen. Let's make it accessible for everybody. Because when you remove the barriers, people can rise up and show you what they can do. But if you put a barricade in front of somebody, how do they get over it to show you what they're capable of? And that's the thing. That's it. Canada, so Ottawa, had a commercial and it ran for a very short period of time and they got rid of it and they removed it online and they just sweetened, got rid of it. Mm. And it said Canada in one city. And they wanted to promote travel and, and everything like that. And it was on YouTube and I'd commented and I said, if this is Canada in one city, why aren't we running our transit like Montreal? Why aren't we as accessible as BC? Why don't we have the options of local travel like Newfoundland? And like I, I went through and I just researched like good parts of mm -hmm. province and territory and everything and, and just threw it up there. And they removed that so quickly. And not just my comment, but the video itself. Gone. But that's it. If you're going to market this city as being a tourist attraction, what about the accessible. tourists you're trying to attract? Yeah. Because guess what? There are people that use wheelchairs in every city, in every country in this world. Right. And, yes, and, I, and I know a number of them that, that earned very good living compro programming computers, like very good living, have written yeah. tons of code, have money to spend. Was, oh, wait a minute. It, th there's this sort of false dichotomy that if you are in a chair, you probably <clears throat> are barely making a living. I'm like, that is not true at all. Nope. Sure, there's certainly members of society like that, but then again, there's members of society that are like me that are barely making a living. Yeah. So it just, it's across all walks. So it's, again, level the playing field or, or take the, remove the barrier. Because guess what? Folks have money to spend and they're happy to spend it. Yeah. Where they're yep. welcome. The number of times I've gone to a show and so w when I go to a local rock show, I get lifted up into any venue I want to go into. People just know me. If I'm not at a show, mm -hmm. the band will text me and go, why aren't you here? I have a ticket for you. Like <laughs> that sort of uh, relationship. And when it came down to 
getting into shows and me posting about going out and everything like that, people would come to me and say, oh, I'd love to be able to, to get in. I don't really have any friends that'll lift me in. And Or someone used a power chair. The girl I've known since I was like six years old uh, uses a power chair. And she goes, oh, I wonder how I'd be able to get in to the rainbow or mm. to, and, and mm. this isn't me calling out rainbow. Love no, you guys. No. I love you guys. No. Yeah. yeah I, 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 I just, to get in. just happened to pick one of my favorite venues, but yeah, there's a staircase to get in. There's no, no added yeah. on ramp or, yeah. or anything like that or elevator. And the city needs to provide that funding. The city needs to, if the city wants to promote nightlife, they wanted to have a nightmare. Well, if they're not going to promote me, they're going to have a nightmare on their hands one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes down to putting in accessibility features, put an elevator in, make it so that everyone can get into every venue everywhere. Put one at the Brass Monkey, mm -hmm. uh, like all, all the places that people wish they can get into. Um, and I'm trying to think of all, all the, the places that deserve funding to be able to do this because you guys are, are amazing venues with amazing human beings running mm -hmm. them, right. um, you know. Who would and like to make it more accessible, but it's, you know, a budgetary limitation, right? And they really, cases. and Scotty at Brass Monkey you know, has probably lifted me personally, helped lift me personally several hundred times in the past mm -hmm. few years. Yeah, like that was my first show was there. I, I showed up, not no care in the world, didn't even mm -hmm. look the place up. I get there and I go, oh, okay, cool. Where's the place? Underground. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll see you guys later. You're not going anywhere. You're coming with us. And they, they lifted me down. Warren from one of the bands lifted me down and a couple of guys. And it was, that's just how it's become. Mm -hmm. yeah. But a lot of people don't have this freedom. Well, uh, and of, of, yeah. Mother, who uh, he's 82 now, and he had a spinal injury about 50 years ago. And he only discovered maybe 10 or 15 years ago that the doctor said, you shouldn't lift anything heavier than a glass of wine. My mother said, he's a beer drinker. Okay, Coors Light in a can. But he doesn't drink anything anymore. Like, he, he can't because he has severe arthritis and he needs a cane. And they had to get a chairlift for him. It, this is None of this is secret. This is all known. And my mother keeps trying to buy him a scooter. And he's like, I don't want it. But he can only walk. Like, he'll come over here and he'll get out and we'll walk over to the pub, which is 200 meters from my front door. And he has to stop three or four times, right? And places that have stairs are difficult for him. He's having a hard time with it. And it, and it's, he's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's accepted that there's limitations. And he's like, I had a, I've, had a, I've had a great life. And at 82, it's difficult for me to get around now. And he accepts that. But if we had more accessible spaces for him, it's like when he goes to the Legion in Orleans, he has a key to the elevator because he's a Legion member, retired military. So we go in, he walks in, gets the key, takes his guitar up because he can't do the stairs. He simply can't do it. If we make access, if we make everything uh, accessible for everybody, it improves everybody's quality of life because you're a quality dude. And we've hung out a number of times and it's like, Anybody who wants to hang out and have a good time at a concert, you got to hang out with Kyle because it will just rock your night. And everybody comes up to you, right? And the bands all know you. I mean, the Alexis on Fire, that was on, uh, I think it was on TV. It was in, and I was like, yeah, they, they invited you up on stage. You were, they're like, that dude's crowd surfing in a chair. Brought him right up on stage. My favorite was Billy Talent last year. Right? Oh, yeah. Last year, two years ago, and Ben sees me, pulls me up on stage. And I'll let know. Quick backstory, Billy Talent was the first band I ever crowd surfed. Yeah. And I crowd surfed that band only because they stopped the show when someone fell down and said, hey, pick him back up. And I went, if I'm going to fall down, I'll be okay. And it might happen. I'll be in mm -hmm. good hands. Yeah. No problem. And crowd surfed that show, got to the front. We all know how I, many of us know how that happened. I'll finish this real quick. He, he had me sing with him. And that song was uh, We Are The Sound. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. That song was um, How It Goes. And How It Goes, um, it was written for uh, Aaron, their their drummer. Yes. Who has MS. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was fitting because I was starting my MS journey back then too, but I didn't know it. 
And sorry, a little, a little That's emotional. Okay. Dude, we cry on this show all the time. 13 years of, of history with this band. And so he pulls me up on stage this time and he gives me a big hug and he goes, good to see you back. And cause I was, I hadn't been able to see them. I had mm -hmm. my, my, I had a pressure sore. Yeah, I'll put I it remember. Out. Those aren't fun. No. Uh, and so they'd been back a couple of times and I missed them. And finally went and saw them and, and he goes, good to see you back. Wallaby, well, you're still there for you. And that's why I went and sat side stage and had some nice waters, Canadian waters. Canadian and, waters, yeah. <laughs> and it was a good time. And But that's what the concert community offers. Mm -hmm. I don't care where you're going. Whether you're going to, to a huge show like Billy Talent, whether you're going to a, a local show with bands you've never even heard of, mm -hmm. whether you're going to your buddy's show, bands love to see fans participating yeah. and we take away an entire demographic of people and just say, yeah, no, sorry, we're not going to let you in right. here. They, they don't even call it discrimination because this is built in discrimination. It really is systemic. The wheelchair has been around for 500 years. Why weren't buildings built back then? Like people use wheelchairs. Yep. Yeah. This is not a new thing, right? <laughs> This is no. 500 years and we're just, just creating access now. What yeah. the hell? What the hell? We've had so many decades of people building, thinking only of, oh yeah, anybody can use this. Just a, it's just a flight of stairs. No, no, that's not true. Not anybody can use it. Let's make it accessible to everyone. And like I said, it, we've been friends for a number of years and my father is, this, this thing with my dad is only in the last three years. Prior to that, he was really mobile, but he was starting to get a little bit sore. But now his mobility is really limited. Uh, I remember once, <coughs> about a year or two ago, we went into a Lowe's to pick up some material for a, a picture he was going to frame for me. And we get in, he was walking down and he stops and he goes, could you go get me a cart? I went, okay. So I go get, people watch me walking to get the cart. I get on the cart and I'm like, no, it's for my dad. It's for my dad. I swear it's for my dad. <laughs> It was, it was funny. <laughs> People looking at me, I'm like, no, it's for my dad, really. So I was moving the cart and I got off of it to, to move something out of the way so I could get, and then it wouldn't start up again. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? And one of the, uh, the staff members saw, he goes, what? I said, this is for my dad. He's just over there. He goes, here, let me help you. He goes, it's designed for people that are a little bit bigger than you. I'm like, what? He goes, you don't weigh enough to trigger us. <laughs> I'm like, What? There's a pressure thing on the seat. He goes, yeah, you're not heavy enough. You need to be heavier to trigger the thing. I'm like, that's an oversight. Don't you think? Yeah. He's like, yeah, we're, we've ordered new ones. We don't know when we'll get them. So anyway, I drove it and my dad got on it and then we were able to do the things we needed to do. But yeah, we need to make, we need to make things more accessible for everyone. Kyle, we have some kids in the chat that are asking if yeah. you have been following what's been going on federally with the Canada disability benefit and if you had any thoughts on that. If not. I have, have not. I have learned the hard way that trying to follow government is mm. like trying to follow a two-year-old. You're just Madly chasing off in all directions. To, yeah, one way or the other. And this two-year-old seems to have a best friend dressed in orange. I just, <laughs> I, I don't. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I hear I, you. I try to follow government daily, and yeah. I think that's probably the best way I've ever heard it described. Following a two-year-old. You're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you're some going, of them behave like two-year-olds in the House of Commons <laughs> if you ever watch Question Period. Yikes. Yeah. No. Never. <laughs> Sat at a municipal government meetings. Yeah. That's enough. That's enough for me. Yeah. No, I get that's it. Yeah. 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 And and here's the thing. I find the municipal government meetings, city councillors, tend to actually have a lot more decorum than they do in the House of Commons. Like a lot oh. more decorum. They don't tend to heckle or shout over each other. It happens, but not like they do in the House of Commons. The House of Commons has become theater because the television cameras are on, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's, they're turning into, we left the UK to get away from the UK, but we're turning into the UK. Yeah. 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 yeah we're we're going to end up having the workers union fighting or something. I don't know, as a party soon, but they, I understand there are different sides and people want to do 
the things they want to do. I, mm-hmm. I almost said people want to do good things, and I remember we're talking about the government. You're not wrong. <laughs> there are some good people in government. I'd like to say that there's probably a few good people in the Conservative Party, but I, don't I know that have that no the doubt case. that people get into government for the right reasons. For the right reasons, no doubt. Yeah. And then they get in there and they see the opportunities to do the things that they can do, and they go, "No, maybe okay." And then once they do okay, it's yeah. They well, there's so much compromise stuff. that takes place. And when that happens, you realize right. the dirty game that is politics. What is it? What is it? Uh, politics is show business for ugly people. I think is that how the yep. saying goes? Yep. <laughs> it's, I prefer to say homely. Homely is on the inside. Homely. But, I, although, I think a more polite man would. Uh, politics is for people who have a face for radio. Okay, so the three of us are just never getting into politics. Nope, right? not happening. <laughs> not happening. I'm still hoping for the Senate seat eventually. <laughs> that would be good, actually, because you can the Senate. You can affect positive change, right? Yeah. So, Waiting for my ugly pill to kick in. It's oh something that I should while while we have you here, I'll let you know about this. This is something that we're throwing together quickly. We're looking in June fifteenth, correct, sir? Mr. Beaver? I, I believe so, yes. Yeah, it's a Saturday. We're, we're trying to put together uh, a mental health walk. So men, health, yeah. M-E-N-T-A-L, mental health walk. It's gonna, we're going to do like a 5K route around Centertown and then finish at the Lieutenant's Pump where we'll do a live uh, show afterwards. And it's about raising awareness. I don't think we're going to be able to have an actual charitable thing this year. We're, we, we just discussed this about a week or two ago and we're trying to get it together as quickly as possible, get the route planned out. But if you'd like to participate at all, it's literally, we're going to do a spin around and the walk is to raise awareness for mental health because men who have mental health crises have very little in the way of support and something like seven or eight out of 10, and I can't remember the exact figure, we'll find it, seven to eight out of 10 suicides are men because they don't have the support they don't have anybody to talk to we're not allowed to show weakness we're not allowed to show vulnerability blah 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 blah, blah. so anyway if you want to take part it's june 15th we haven't got everything squared away yet but i'll send you some messages to let you know if you want to if you want to join in the party that would and be awesome. we'll have a live show afterwards from the pump which by the way is accessible oh yeah trust me fire yeah yep yeah. yeah no there's it, it's cool there's lots of little accessible places in Ottawa, but it's almost like giving me a door, uh, giving me a door that I can um, enter, that I'm allowed to enter, and saying wheelchair yes. only, and wheelchairs only and able bodies only, giving me th- those two different doors. And I feel like we've seen a version of those two different doors at a time Yes. in history, and I'm not going to go there today with you. But No, but I get what you're saying. Yep. And in... I live as part of a demographic that was discarded Mm -hmm. before they found surgeries to to give people lives. And one of my favorite movies of all time is people being discarded at the beginning of the movie, Uh 300. But that's where we were for many years. Mm -hmm. And then it was, okay, we give you the surgery, but now sit in this chair and stay in your house. Yeah. And take away from your quality of life. Exactly. And then there was, okay, now you got this. Now, maybe we'll let you enter the general shop or maybe one restaurant with an attendant. And so over the years, things have been getting better. But I think we're at a time now where society has the ability to make all of these things and just go snap your fingers, make it better. And things aren't happening. There's entire companies that are dedicated to making the world accessible. Almar is one of those companies. I don't have a whole list, but Mm -hmm. not go out and hire a company like that and just say, make every door in here, every, put every ramp in and just do everything instead of, you know what? These people don't deserve to be here. And it's just, we we take, if we take away the word disabled and we take away the word disability Mm -hmm. and and we have people thinking about, and, 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 I understand there's a lot of people that don't like this word for, I don't know what reason, actually. People haven't been giving me a straight reason. But physical difficulty or some version of that for themselves, that's the word I've used for years. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I understand it's a mouthful. But at the end of the day, person without accessibility is what I am. Yeah. And that's not something I expect people to ever use. But that's what I am is Mm -hmm. I have accessibility. 
is Kyle, the gentleman who does the ramps here. So I'm actually, I found the comments. I found them. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> the button over here. The gentleman who does the ramps in Toronto, they did great work here. No, I live in Ottawa, my friends. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Is there anything else that we should get to that, that we, that in the comments, as I, someone said, does so-and-so no. want to ask a question? Okay. But at the end of the day, these companies already exist to do the thinking mm -hmm. for the city. Yeah. I yeah. already exist to do the thinking for the city. So exactly. Do you know mm -hmm. who I was surprised to find out a big corporate behemoth of a company has a complete division that is designed to make their product more accessible to everybody. And you might be surprised when I say this, but they, they are really, they have a complete division that is working. How can we make this work easier for people? Microsoft, they are working actively to make their software accessible to everyone. And uh, their, their vo vo uh, vocal voice recognition, uh, their, their dictation, like they're working on it. It's getting better all the time. Yeah. But they actually have an entire division that is dedicated to that. And I met the guy who was the head of it about a year ago. And I was like, I had no idea. And he was like, we want to make it accessible to everyone because we know that software and computers can enable people to contribute to society in ways that possibly they couldn't have at one point in time, but they can now. And now that we've really fully embraced remote work and stuff like this, look, we're having, we're sitting around having a coffee chat on a Monday morning. Yeah. 20 years ago, this, no, no it would have been a phone call, but nothing like this. We're live in, in, in high definition with high end audio. This was not imaginable. It was imaginable 20 years ago, but not possible. But today mm -hmm. it's an everyday thing we take for granted. So as things become more accessible to everybody, it just makes it better for all of society. That was a question I was going to ask you before. I meant to ask at the beginning. How's my audio coming through for you guys? Good. Really oh, good, actually. Okay. Yeah. I'm on my iPhone. So this is, that's comforting to know. No, it sounds <laughs> really good. I'm like yeah. impressed. I'm impressed with the sound quality. All right. Yeah. No, they have good mics and, and cameras and, and our phones these days, I should say. But I'm, I'm really impressed with it because I was like, it's always a little sketchy. How's it going to sound? Sounds good. Sounds really good. Yeah, the the guy is ugly. Don't mind the camera. That's. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I appreciate it. Though. You, you guys both have hair. I don't. So I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> the guy, the guy is not ugly. <laughs> the guy's definitely not ugly. <laughs> well, let's see. Mr. Beaver here has a has a thing for uh, um, uh, redheads. All right. <laughs> I totally respect boundaries, but yes. A, a, a kid asked, this is, how you doing, Doug, over there? And says, well, my heart just beat a little faster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kyle, now see, now I'm the one that's blushing. Jeez. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, oh, he's so, in, by the way, you should mention, Douglas, that you're in a play right now. Oh yes, we're we're doing a stage uh, community theater stage musical version of Rewill Rocky right now. Oh, so hence sweet. the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Committed to the bit. <laughs> so yeah, he plays a character in it, and where he's got the long hair and the mascara and the whole bit, and doing the whole rock star thing. So yeah, sweet. Yeah, it's pretty cool actually, because I'm the last person to expect that from. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to Banana Rama, so you know, <laughs> I'd listen to rock as well. <laughs> but, so wait a minute, I get to sing rock? I never get to sing rock. <laughs> just please invite me to the party. I just want to be in it. I don't care what role you get, you give me. I just want to be in it somehow. Absolutely. So that's literally that's, I think that's what got me that got me the role actually is because at the end of the audition they said, "Yeah, would you be willing to accept a smaller role?" And I said, "Yeah, I just want to be invited to the party." And I think they found that endearing and therefore they said, "Let's get him in." <laughs> but you have so you've done things like crowd surf at concerts, you've done repelling. Is there something that's on your list that you want to do that you haven't yet? Depends. Are we going to let my mom see this con this show? <laughs> It's up to you. <laughs> I have lived a pretty uh, awesome life. I am so grateful for everything. I mean, something I want to do, I, I want to learn how to sing and play guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, I have sang with the band. Don't, please don't look up that video. Please don't. <laughs> okay. We won't. Okay. We won't. Yeah, that, that's how it went very well. It went so very, <laughs> we can just imagine. To, everything was very on key. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect oh, pitch, the whole bit, right? Yeah. 
The whole, oh yeah, no, <laughs> it's on my Facebook, so you're gonna have to come find it. <laughs> but uh, I won't. I won't post it. I promise. I promise. So yeah, honestly, I, I would love to properly learn how to play guitar. I know how to maybe a couple of chords, but not mm-hmm. all of them. And apparently, all you have to do is move your hand up and down for different chords. Yeah, um, it's like just sliding up and down the fretboard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Didn't get to that part of of the lesson for guitar class when I was in grade 10. Cause one of us, I'm not going to say who, but one of us had a crush on the girl he was sitting beside. So didn't, didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the, uh... a whole lot of it. I tried really <laughs> genuinely, but she was actually very good at guitar herself. Okay. And so was the, like, so we were all sitting in the back and that was where my available seat was at the time. So I went, I'll sit next to you. Okay. Yeah. And because of girls, <laughs> I didn't learn how to play guitar because of girls. And, <laughs> it's, and now I want like to a, learn how to play guitar because of girls. I learned to dance because of girls and then realized that it didn't serve me. <laughs> Tennis too. The time I thought I was going to like girls. And then all of a sudden I'm the only boy in a dance class with 25 other girls who are high kicking. And all I'm doing is like making sure that my family jewels are prote- protected. <laughs> so you don't get the boot. Yes, because the class was only the room was only big enough really for twenty. So <laughs> whatever you do, then don't ever give yourself an eighty pound dog. There's a, yep, no, I, they don't observe that. There's, oh, look, stomp. Oh. Yep. Every day she stomps on me. Every so yeah, uh, yeah, I thought to yep, and uh, what was really funny is I remember all the the boys laughing at me because I was doing dance, and this dude, you don't know what you, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Turns out it wasn't for me, but <laughs> it's like, you're playing. You're the one who's playing football with the boys and tapping everybody else on the butt. I'm the one that's actually hanging out with the girls. Yeah, so yeah. Like, they all think I'm cute. <laughs> yeah, which one of us is doing the gayer thing here? Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about the gayer thing. It's like, but which one is in the place that's more likely to meet girls? So let me see if I get this playing. correct. You're tapping guys on the ass, and afterwards, you're taking showers together, and I'm dancing with girls. Meanwhile, I'm, I wouldn't have said that back then. The hands go in certain places when you're doing a chairlift. I'm just, just saying, saying, it's like, I, I'm 15 and I felt up more girl butt than you have. I didn't actually feel up. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you mean. You, I know what you, but hey, you know what I mean? It's like, you can laugh at me all you want, but I found the secret. Now, unfortunately, I can't use it. <laughs> but I found the secret. <laughs> it's like that other boy in class who does the figure skating who you're laughing at. Call him in 10 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. But uh, Elvis, yeah. is that you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think really? he did okay. I think he did all yeah. right for himself. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, if not activities, then bands. Who have you not seen yet that you want to? Oh, how, who have you not seen yet? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. A lot of the bands that I'm interested in seeing are like retiring and, and winding sort of, it down. Yeah. Yeah. Winding it down. Sum um, 41's doing their farewell tour this summer. Eh? Uh, so when Sum 41 came to Ottawa, oh, let me tell you, I crowd surfed and crowd control counted it up together. <laughs> so obviously they don't know me at all. Uh, 22 times they said. <laughs> really <laughs> i went up 22 times and i just i would leave i would literally run through the end of the pit and then come right back and go up go and people were more than happy to oblige and <laughs> yeah awesome so 22 times dur- dur- just during their set wow so that's what an hour and a half set yeah 90 minutes every three minutes yeah or something like that you didn't even get yeah. to see the show. You were surfing the whole time. <laughs> oh, no, I got to see it from up top. It was great. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what I should have done at the Madonna concert. Damn. Crowd surfing at the Madonna <laughs> concert? I've never crowd surfed. Ever. You've never crowd surfed? I've never crowd surfed. I do not okay, know what my it's friend, like. we are. I, so I have a friend who's a wonderful friend who works for Blues Fest that has a festival pass that that, that loves to help me out. They, they don't get to see the shows. And so you and I are going to go see a show. Who do you want to see? I don't know who's on this year, but I like music. Good period. lineup this year. I, we're I, we're I, gonna I, I'm we're not. gonna connect. We're gonna make this happen. You are going to crowd surf this year. Nice. You're gonna crowd. See, super Kyle making dreams come them. true. <laughs> Absolutely. 
<laughs> I, I'm not even going to be here for Blues Fest this year. I'm going to be in Calgary. I'm going up for a stampede to see a buddy. I haven't been to Stampede in 50 years, so I think it's time I go back and pay it a visit. So, yeah, I won't be here because it starts July 5th, so I won't be here for Blues Fest for the first time ever. There was, I've only missed, in the entire history of Blues Fest, there's only one year I didn't go because there was the bands, there was not a whole lot of acts I wanted to see that year. There were a couple of DJs, but they were on like a Wednesday night, and I'm up at 5 a.m., I tend to go to the Friday, Saturday shows. The weeknight shows are just too much for me, right? Because I get up at 5 a.m. every day. And if you get home at midnight and your adrenaline is still pumping from the show, it just, I can't function. So I worked at Amazon for a while until I found out the manager wouldn't promote me because I use a wheelchair. Oh, uh, for Christ's sake. Oh, but they wouldn't say that out loud. So. Of course not. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but they said it out loud to a colleague of mine. And, and that was, yeah. I left, went to Rogers, and then Rogers bought us all out when they merged. But worked for Amazon while I was going to Blues Fest. Oh, my God. Yeah. And went to Blues Fest and then got home at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. I have to get up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning to be able to get ready for a 6 o'clock bus, mm -hmm. 5, 5.45 a.m. bus, which was early at the time Yeah. Uh, until somebody – work to change it and at the end of the day i think i got 16 hours that week of sleep in a week if i'm lucky, if I'm lucky. god almighty yeah yep and so people are, are looking at me going but it was just during the main week that i really struggled mm -hmm. and they're all everyone's looking at me going kyle you have bags under your eyes and i go yeah it's to carry my t-shirts in yeah. <laughs> oh it was crazy. Are you on LinkedIn or other social? I am super Kyle Humphrey on LinkedIn. There you go. Put periods in between each word. You mentioned the bags under your eyes because sometimes I have them and I turn around and say, yes, yeah, but mine are Louis Vuitton. <laughs> Real close. I'm going to see some little LVs. And... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, you get the little tiny little. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're Louis Vuitton. Can you not see that? Louis Vuitton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What was the best <laughs> concert you've ever been to, sir? <laughs> like your best, the concert that absolutely blew your mind and rocked your world. Who was it? Yes. So that's a loaded question. Oh, it's yeah, because there's like big oh, shows, small venues. Not you know. not necessarily. It's more because of, I judge shows by the experience I had. Right. Not necessarily. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. No. Yeah. That, that's like, how I see it, too. At the end of the day, I could be having fun with my friends. Mm-hmm and give you that as my, my 10 out of 10 show. That could be that show. Mm -hmm. And then you could have gone, I was at that show too, and that show wasn't very good. You know what I mean? It's like, your personal experience, yeah. It's, it, it's all mine, because yeah. at the end of the day, unless I'm sitting like directly front row, I'm staring at butts the whole time. Mm -hmm. One of us needs to get a wheelchair, I'm not gonna say who, Drew Beaver. <clears throat> Anyways. I, I really enjoy my time with Billy Talon, but locally, I've literally sang with the band Winter and with the band Beyond Driven, so that's that was huge, and I'm going to be, hopefully, at some point, promoting a show with another band, or a, a song with another band that, that I've written part of the song to, but oh, when it comes to all-time fate, like, and that's the thing, I have so many different mm -hmm. little things that could make it, here's my favorite, I would have to say... As far as any shows go, I, I have to give it to my boys and Billy Talent. Yeah, okay. Uh, Alexis on Fire. I waited 16 years to see them. Mm -hmm. Wait, wow, wait, when was it? Yeah, about, about 16 years, 15 years. Because they were the band that I got punished from going to see when I was in high school. Oh. And I told my buddy this story. And then when they made, made the announcement, he messages me and goes, guess who's coming to town? <laughs> and so we got our tickets for that day and went and got to to experience that. And then he calls me up on stage and he asks me my name. Or caller asks me my name. And and I look at him and I didn't have that. Yeah. 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 And, and then... What's your name? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I have one. Yes. It was at that point where I think he decided that I was either too drunk or not able to speak at some yeah. point. He just went back and played his show. And then they're like getting off the stage. And all I could think about was screaming, my name is Kyle. <laughs> As he's like, because he, they, they just run off the stage when they walk off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm like, my name is Kyle. And they just booked it. So now, oh, now, now you're, you're thinking he thinks I'm special. No, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. I'm never getting called up by Dallas <laughs> Green ever. Uh, okay. Here's one. It says ha, through your crowd surfing or through any other ways, did you actually have you ever ended up in an actual music video somehow? Oh no. I almost okay. ended What's up. What's Billy Talent waiting for then? There you go. Let's go. They need to make a music video and have you star in it. You, you know what they need to do? They need to make a music video. They need to make, make a song with this cute little band called the Lazies from from Australia. Okay. They need to make a song with these guys because they, they, they have them signed to their label. And I think that would be absolutely killer to have all those guys on a track. And the Lazies were my first headlining show in the underground scene. Okay. And Billy Talent was the first band I ever crowd surfed. And my second rock show, I think, my first rock show was Cedar. I was 16 years old. Okay. My girlfriend wanted to go see this band. And I was like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was fun. Either that's but serious. If Cedar, when I was 16, I'm 34. So it's Cedar 18 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Back when yeah. they were so at the top. This was serious. back when fans. Actually, that's not true. I've also, I'd also seen. Three Days Grace with, but when they had Adam. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. <sighs> I now watch Three Days Grace play Riot, and it's not the same thing. No. It's not the same okay. thing as it was 18, 18 years ago. I watched uh, Blink 182 play Coachella last year, and I went, Yeah, they're, they're older now. It shows. Yeah. You know, yeah. They're older now. Uh, Whereas you watch the Stones and Mick Jagger is still doing the same thing he's always done. And I'm like, the man is 82 years old. How the hell is that even possible? Yeah. And he's well, still doing it. So Three Days Grace and Adam Gantier aren't the same thing anymore. And I've watched, mm -hmm. I've seen Adam Gantier play with mm -hmm. his new band. Forgive me for not knowing the name. If anyone knows it, go ahead. But I've wa watched Adam Gantier play his songs that he did with Three Days Grace and we all absolutely still do the exact same thing we did 18 years ago. We just go absolutely insane. So I think it's the nostalgia of having him do it and having that specific voice. Like, like people come on here because and listen to your podcast because they, they want to hear you guys and your voices and your personalities and, and that sort of thing. And, and then they get stuck with me. But Don't be ridiculous. But that's the thing. People go see certain acts for certain reasons. And I guess we all absolutely love Adam Gonti. Same to Sony, I believe. Is ASMR the right now, and everybody wants to just relax and take it easy. <laughs> we brought out the red mic for it. There we oh, go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was I going to say? That, uh, just we, we should wrap up shortly because i got a meeting in a couple of minutes. I, I'm actually working from home today, too. I was going to say, the, so I've been lucky enough to see a lot of shows. And then again, I'm 56 this summer, so I've been around for a little while. <clears throat> And without a doubt, the best show I've ever seen, without a doubt, no questions. And it wasn't just the experience, it was the actual performance by the artist, was at M. Talis, which used to be Metropolis in Montreal, to see Rainwolf. It was myself and Laura, our mutual friend Laura was there, and my buddy Phil and her partner at the time and we went to see rain wolf at m Tellus, and we all we were we stood off a little to the side of the stage and i remember the show ends and we all stood and looked at one another just like it was a simple like nothing spectacular no big lighting effects no big crazy no he just came out and played straight ahead led zeppelin style bluesy rock and roll and he mm -hmm. burned the house down He's okay. It's time to get a, a, okay, guys, take a break. Sends his drummer and bass player off. He sits behind the drum kit playing guitar and drums and singing. Uh, forming chords with one hand and he'd strum once in a while, but he kept playing the drums. I'm like, this guy is a freak of nature. He's like, you know what? We're too far from the audience. Brought the drum kit onto the floor. He stood on the bass drum, wrapped the mic around his head, played guitar, sang into the mic while it was just hanging here off his neck. And the bass player was still on stage. And I'm like, that is dedication. If you ever get a chance to see Rainwolf, go. You will not be disappointed. He wow. plays his heart out. And, and these are the acts that I wonder. And and like you and I get to go see these shows and whatever. Absolutely, we can. But I wouldn't have heard of Rainwolf if it wasn't for you. And we really need to pump these guys up because. Some of them are Canadians putting on too. amazing shows, yeah. like Civilian. 
Yeah. Are you kidding me? What are you guys doing? Like, how are you so good? You have no right to be so good. And there's, what was I thinking about just a couple of minutes ago? Tammy Sorry, awesome little band with a redheaded singer. So, hey, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> um, Larkin Poe. <laughs> if you like traditional blues. Yeah. Sisters. One sister plays the slide guitar. The other one plays lead. And they both exchange singing. And yeah. the band is just a couple of guys in the back backing them up. Because these yep. two ladies are the front and center of the band, and they blew my mind. Oh, blew that's my right. mind. that was Larkin Poe, you said? Yeah. Yeah, no, the, I've been, so I've been listening to them. I have to go see them live. Oh, I saw them at City Folk. They were in the Aberdeen oh, Pavilion. Okay. Blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. Ian Thornley, Alan's mentoning Ian Thornley here. Alan Humphrey mentioning, mentioning Ian. I was lucky enough to see Big Wreck on a Tuesday night. I was in Toronto. I was walking downtown and I'm on Queen Street and I'm walking up. I'll go, oh, maybe I'll go into the horseshoe. And it had a sandwich board out front. It said, tonight, one night only, fundraiser, food bank fundraiser, <laughs> big wreck. I saw a big wreck at the I horseshoe. I have no audio. Oh, you lost your sound? Oh, he's going to have to jump in and out. Yeah, I saw a big wreck at the horseshoe tavern in downtown Toronto. It was mind blowing. I was very lucky, very fortunate. We just happened to, to stumble upon it. There we go. There's Kyle. He's back now. I had, no, I had no audio for a sec. Yeah. Can you hear us now? I can hear you now. Okay. Great. Yeah. I, I got to see Big Wreck at the, uh, at the Horseshoe Tavern in Toronto. Just on a Tuesday night walking along, said uh, tonight, one night only, food bank fundraiser, Big Wreck. I just walked in, got in line, sat there, and I was just blown. It, it, Ian Thornley is an incredible singer and an unbelievable player. Mm -hmm. It's a band, and they, they played the Bronson Center, I think, twice in the last year, right? Eh? I know I was there for one of them. Yeah, they put on a hell of a show, man. Mm -hmm. And of course, that song is that, that's, every time I hear that, I just, sp spine tangles. You know? No, absolutely. And then Big Sugar was here too. Yeah, I've seen them mm -hmm. a couple of times, and oh my God, wear your earplugs when you go to see Big Sugar. Yeah, I've heard it's one of the loudest concerts you can go to is Big Sugar. Gordy Johnson plays so loud. I had to stand way off to the side the first time I saw them about 25 years ago. And it was in the 90s when I saw them at, at Lansdowne. They were playing in the Civic Center during Super X, when we had Super X. I had to stand off to the side. It was, I couldn't handle it. And my buddies, like I told you, bring earplugs. I'm like, oh my God. So now I wear earplugs to every show because since I lost hearing in this ear, I have a, the funny thing is when you put headphones on, like these type of even though I've only got about 40% uh, audibility, when you put these on, it balances out internally. The brain just figures it out. But if I take this one off, this is just, <laughs> when I put them on, I'm okay. But yeah, when I go to shows, I absolutely wear earplugs. Absolutely. Even when I went to, we went to the City in Color, Nathaniel Rateliff show recently at the uh, CTC, I had to wear earplugs and everybody's like, oh, that must suck. And I go, you get used to it. I took my mom to Rod Stewart. We were on the floor. We were like 10 rows back. And I, I, they started Cheap Trick opened and I've seen Cheap Trick a few times over the years. The first time I saw them was back in 88 at the Civic, at the Super X. And so my mom is a huge Rod Stewart fan, just loves Rod Stewart. And you know what? He came out for over two hours, put on a hell of a show. And I was like, way to go, Rod, at 80 years old still. And he brought the soccer balls out. He didn't kick them though. His bandmates did. And most of his band is, are, are women. And, and when they first came out, they do a, a thing. When they came out on stage, it looked Addicted to Love, uh, Robert Palmer, where he had all mm -hmm. the French models. So they came out and pretended to play. I'm like, oh, that's silly. Came out the next song, and they were playing. And I go, oh, they're so young. And then they zoom in on their faces on the screen, and I'm like, oh, no, they're in their 40s. They're seasoned musicians. It's just that the, when you first saw them, you thought they were 20 years old. But when you saw it close, I'm like, oh, no. Okay, well done, Rod. You hired seasoned professional musicians, and they Put on a hell of a show. It was a great show. It really was. But yeah, earplugs. Yeah. Got to save what you got left. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, indeed. we should, I should, yeah, we should start wrap up. I got a meeting in 15 minutes. Do you have anything that you want to leave our viewers or our listeners with, Kyle, before we go? I honestly, I just want to thank you, got you both for having me today. Oh, uh, dude, this this has been amazing. Cool. This is great. Good times. We'll have you back for sure. Absolutely. Have you back. And, and you're going to take this guy have a crowd surfing. Fest. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And Paul, you, you got to get, you got to get him started with me. So <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll get you guys connected. Yeah. Well, I will. In the air. I'll, I'll connect with Paul. Yeah. At the end of the day, I am just really hoping that the 
world understands that if you see someone that has a mobility device or if they have any sort of difference, whether it's uh, a pair of glasses. No one, mobility device. Literally. There you go. Good timing. A pair of glasses or, or hearing aid, whatever it is. Oh, they're all mobility that, devices. They're mobility devices. And that doesn't mean that person is disabled. Nope. It means nope. that they, they, they do something differently. And that's the thing. It's like, okay, this is a mobility device. I cannot drive a vehicle without them. I don't even like to walk around without them because everything is blurry. So I put yep. these on. And do you think I'm disabled? Of course you don't. You're just wearing glasses. I'm going to need hearing aids yep. eventually too. So I have glasses and hearing aids. Am I disabled? No, of course I'm not. You have, I'm like, how's that any difference if you're in a chair, a walker, a scooter, or have a cane? Yep. You're not disabled. You're differently abled. And that's, you said it. I want to leave it there. All yeah. right, brother. All right. Absolutely. Kyle, you, buddy. You're definitely get the, getting all the love uh, in the chat. Get Kyle back. Bring Super Kyle back. Kyle is truly super. Love seeing him. Kyle, thanks for coming out today. I'll come back another time. Great fun today, lads. Um, you know, just... So, we like to give the people what they want, so I guess you'll be coming back. I guess so. This is yeah. better than coffee to start my day, guys. Uh, oh, Mon Mondays oh, and Fridays, so man. We do long shows on Mondays and Fridays because I work from home. The rest of the week, we, we do about an hour, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because I have to be in the office. But yeah, Mondays and Fridays, anytime you want to pop in, uh, just, just send me a message and I'll send you a link and we can bring you in the show. Sounds like a plan. Maybe we'll we'll have a recap of what I did that weekend or something. Yeah, no, Ooh, that sounds good. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> good like that. All right, brother, you take care. It's good to see you. Right. You guys too. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Ah, what a great guy. Told you, brother. I told you. You, you did tell me. You did tell me and you did not lie. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot of things, but a liar is not one of them. No, no, no. And uh, yeah, he, he's not hard on the eyes. <laughs> see, I, I didn't tell you in advance that because I thought it would be better to see the surprise on your face. But oh, because as everybody knows... I didn't do my hair. Mr. Yes, but like I said, all the redheads in the world are safe because they are, even though I have a weakness for them, they're allergic to me. So they're all safe. <laughs> they're all safe. And don't worry, Kyle's girlfriend. I will be a perfect gentleman when oh, I'm up yeah, in the yeah. air. There's no concern for that. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll be a perfect gentleman when I have my legs up in the air. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> I need another coffee, man. <laughs> you can't do that to me. Oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> what? We're going to be crowd surfing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's perfectly innocent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's wrap, wrap it up. <laughs> That's what he said. Uh, sorry. Oh, I'm so stop sorry. it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You like how I made my mic, my mic invisible? It's floating in space. <laughs> ah, pretty I cool. green screened it. Ah, lovely. That's cool. Huh? I like that. So if I put my arm, see, you can see there. Ah, yes. Right. But I, I had extra material, so I thought that'd be fun. Looks like it's floating. Oh, man. Oh, okay, kids and cubs. We hope that you <laughs> love this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show because we love making it for you. Always with just a little touch of cheekiness. Yes, but it's all in good fun. It's all in good fun. Remember that sharing is caring and please tell your peeps and poops all about us because you have the words that you have the mouse from which we want the good word to travel. If you would like to support us, you can do that by going to our pod page site. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And thanks to the Ray Girl, if you scan that QR code right there underneath my chin, that will bring you to our pod page site. And when we have an episode that's fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. If you'd like to help us out in other ways, you can go to our true north eager beaver media incorporated YouTube page, which saw a bump in subscribers over the weekend because of Mr. Grizzly put on some shorts and it seems to have uh, drawn the people. Now, mm -hmm. when I say Mr. Grizzly put on some shorts, it's not that he put on red length shorts and showed his gorgeous legs to the world. He actually just put shorts on our YouTube page. Like this? And, yes. Uh, uh, there we go. <laughs> Be on a beat. In a speed. Just there what go. everybody wanted to see. 
And uh, yeah, because of that, we passed our goal of 700. We're now at 717 subscribers. It went like from about 676 or 678 to 717. Poof. Thank you for helping us reach our goal. 700 was our goal. And now the next one, of course, is 750, which will mean that we're three quarters of the way to a thousand. And that the thousand magical things start happening for us. Mm. Apparently, we get money just for the number of times that our show is played from YouTube. And that would be very nice and helpful. So anything that you can do to help us to get to a thousand eventually, but 750, our next goal, that would be very helpful. We would appreciate that very much. There's there's almost a thousand people watching live right now. Many of them are on different platforms. They're watching on Twitter or Facebook or a a number of Twitter feeds, a number of Facebook feeds and another YouTube channel. But if you see the QR code right here, that'll take you directly to it. And if you want, I can also give you, I'll put the link it's not a it's not a clickable link, obviously, but I can make it a clickable link, but it's on the screen for those watching. And I can put this in the chat. And here's the thing. It will actually show up on, on a, a number of different services when I put it in the chat. OK, so not just on YouTube, but if I put okay. the, if I put a link in the chat right here, it'll be that same link you see there and paste it in. It shows up on Facebook, a couple of YouTubes, Twitch streams as well so you can always click on it there it doesn't show up in twitter i have to feed that differently but that's okay that's fine but yeah we are we are growing so uh, thank you thank you all so much there you go so if you want to make a lane and go to our true north eager beaver youtube site you can click on like share and subscribe and help boost our numbers there that would be a wonderful thing for you to do. If you would like to support us in other ways, you can go to our coffee page and contribute to the Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. That QR code to which Mr. Grizzly has just pointed will bring you right there. And if you're listening, it's uh, coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And if you go there, if you happen to have a couple of toonies or loonies still in your pocket, loose shaking after the end of last month and would like to contribute them to help us produce the show for you, we would very much appreciate it. As uh, have Kit Wendy, who gave us a little something saying, thank you, gents. Appreciate you and your insights every morning. Cheers. Happy long weekend. That was right before we left for Easter. Miss Shattuca and family, thank you so very much. Sent us a Just a little heart emoji, some love. And as Kit Vim has as well, thank you, dear one, with the note sending positive vibes and love also with the heart. So if you would like to help us that way, every contribution is appreciated, goes back into the show. And of course, if you cannot contribute financially, that is not a problem. Please do not worry whatsoever. The gift of your attention is the gift that matters to us most. Exactly. And if you retweet, and share, and comments, and participate in the chat and all that good stuff, that's that means the world to us. So if you can donate, great. And if you can't, please don't worry. That is not a condition. You are always welcome at the Beaver Lodge, regardless. Because democracy is something that you do write those letters, please. It's very important very important to let your MPs, your MLAs, your MPPs, your senators and members of the media know what it is that is on your mind, what you support, what you don't. And if you have time, why not ask your elected representative for a face-to-face meeting? Yes, Ms. Shattuck, I will be doing an ASMR tonight. I've taken the last two weeks off because I've been not feeling good, but I'm back to feeling myself again. So I will be doing a I will be doing an ASMR this evening at 9 p.m. on my personal YouTube channel. And I will give you another link here for a new show that's just started there was there was some folks were able to join in on saturday mohan and shattuck were guests of mademoiselle fox who now has her own youtube channel and is going to do a once a week show i've just pasted the link in the chat and that is for uh, fun and feminist conversations she's going to do it thursday nights at 7 p.m on her own youtube channel whoa nice yeah nice yeah. Ah, more shows adding to our little family. I love it. Exactly. It's not part of the Cryer Media Network, but it may become that part. I, I haven't chatted but with you about it. it's definitely part of the True North Figure Beaver Media Network. Exactly. Exactly. 
Exactly. We are growing soon. Global domination. Ah, cue thunder, cue lightning. I, I don't want to dominate anything. <laughs> you keep on saying that. Let me have my fun. <laughs> I'm not going to submit to anybody either, mind you, but I don't want to dominate. My God. By global domination, I mean getting to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. No, okay. <laughs> the and then we take over the, the world. First thousand are the hardest. And then we take over the world. <laughs> no, no taking over anything. Give me freedom or give me my podcast. <laughs> All right, kids and cubs. I think that's everything I've got. So from the Beaver Lodge, it could be a tough world out there. So please be kind too and gentle with yourself. And of course, a big thank you for to Super Kyle for making some time for us today. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom, please? Yeah, I'm going to try something here. Just give me a sec quickly, because uh, I guess the, 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 it's coming up weirdly. I don't know what's happening here. My apologies. I'm, my mind is wandering all over the place. I'm just going to try this link and see if it works. Does it work? Go to channel. Yeah, it's taken us to our channel for some reason. I don't understand that. Okay, we'll figure that out later. Um, my apologies. I was just trying to get, uh, it looks like it's the link is the wrong one. I don't know what's going on. I'll, I'll figure out the science of it later. <laughs> right. uh, if you click on it, it takes you to a, a channel. I don't know what why it's done in that. Anyway, uh, words of wisdom. Yeah, get out and, and get involved in your community. If, if, you know, after having Kyle on as a guest today, think about those of us in the community that may have a little bit more time getting around our neighborhood. Do what you can to try and make their life a little bit easier because when accessibility is available to everybody, everybody has a chance to show you what they can do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, for people who are wondering that the, the link, it is activateyourneighborhood.ca. Activateyourneighborhood, all in one word, dot CA. All right. Mr. Grizzly, as uh, Kit Michael says here, who's back from vacation, I hope you had a good one, good friend. Please cue the cock. I, I, uh, I will do that. I just have to. There he is. I found him. I got him. Here we are. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, kits and cubs. Kit Nishetika saying I should do a book reading podcast because she could fall asleep to my voice. I will take that as a compliment. <laughs> um, go to, uh, go to uh, asx.com. And you can sign up and set yourself up for a, uh, you can do Audible, narrate for Audible if you like. Oh, okay. You'll have to send me information about that. That, that, that would be cool. Don't know what's going on with my green screen, but I have a, a little extra punk look here. I apparently have green in my hair. I see that. Today, which is interesting. Oh, there you go. It's a very, and consideration Douglas. Not sure. Missing. The, that was from Kit Mohan. I think I'm missing the, the beginning part of that sentence, sir, to know what it is that you were trying to say. Um, all right. Does Easter egg, just a little note, congratulations to Gabriella Dabrowski, a tennis player from Ottawa who made it to the finals of the WTA event in doubles in Miami. Unfortunately, did not win the final, but a good final showing is still a big deal for her and her partner, Aaron Routliff. And the World, the world Men's Curling Championships are on at the moment and team canada so far after the first three matches are three and oh so things are going very well but right now they're on ice against team italy and it is a big battle because team italy is the number one team in the world at the present moment and team canada under gushu is the number two team in the world at the moment it's going to be a bit of a battle this is the match that everybody wanted to see and that everybody is expects is going to be the final this year so that the round robin match is actually on the ice now if and there's maybe about maybe a couple of minutes left i don't know how long maybe an hour left or so if people wanted to switch there but let's cheer on our team canada here all right mr grizzly i think it's time for your words of wisdom no i already gave them 
You gave them? Yeah. This is All the right. Easter egg, dude. <laughs> so, yes. Sorry. Yep. Yep. I lost. All right. I didn't nail the dismount this time, kids. I'll try again tomorrow. <laughs> All right. I'll see you. <laughs>